41-year-old woman is behind bars for fatally shooting a 32-year-old man. At 6pm on Sunday the 14th of January, authorities responded to the 300 block of Dugan Street in Blytheville, Arkansas and reports of a man shot. When officers arrived, they found a man in a critical condition suffering from a gunshot wound. Medics transported him to the Great River Medical Center, where he later died. The victim was identified as 32-year-old Joe Newmy. During the investigation, detectives identified 41-year-old Tiffany Harris as a suspect. She was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and possession of a firearm by certain persons. At 10.41pm that night, Tiffany was booked into the Mississippi County Detention Center, where she remains held without bond. The motive of the killing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. An inmate who escaped from jail in Memphis, Tennessee during inclement weather spent less than an hour in the snow before turning himself back into custody. At around 10pm on Sunday the 14th of January, Memphis police said they were told that 20-year-old Demarcus Davis escaped custody from another agency. By 10.35pm, Demarcus asked a civilian to call police so that he could turn himself in. Memphis police said he was found in the 100 block of Madison Avenue and then transported to jail. Shelby County Sheriff's Office records indicate that Demarcus is charged with one count of escape and two counts of rape of a child. 37-year-old Donald Patrick is behind bars for fatally shooting the mother of his child, 34-year-old Chitirica Bell. At around 9.50pm on Friday the 5th of January, authorities received a 911 call from a person who said a child came to their home stating that the mother had been shot inside their apartment, located at 2669 Kirby Road in Robinsonville, Mississippi. When deputies arrived at the scene, they heard additional shots fired inside the apartment and located two additional children outside. Deputies quickly learned that Shatirika and Donald, as well as a newborn baby, were inside the apartment. They secured the scene and evacuated the surrounding residences. Deputies spoke to Donald via phone and were able to get him to put down his weapon and come out of the apartment. He was detained at around 10.35pm. Donald told deputies at the scene that he shot his child's mother and that there was a newborn in the apartment. The baby was found unharmed. Deputies found Shatirika inside the apartment with a gunshot wound. She succumbed to her injuries and was pronounced dead at the scene by the Tunica County Coroner. Donald's charged with murder, aggravated domestic violence, two counts of felon in possession of a weapon and possession of a stolen firearm. He's been held at the Tunica County Detention Center on a $325,000 bond. The motive of the killing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. 39-year-old Kelvin Forsell is behind bars for fatally shooting his infant daughter and the child's mother. At around 5.30pm on Sunday the 14th of January, Authorities responded to a residence in the Oak Village Mobile Home Park near Highway 30 in Gonzales, Louisiana and reports of shots fired. When deputies arrived, they entered the mobile home and found a woman and a one-year-old girl deceased with gunshot wounds. The victims were identified as 41-year-old Christina Linatus and one-year-old Kaylee Forsell. Ascension Parish Sheriff Bobby Weber said that the mother and the child were shot in the head at close range and that investigators believe the shooting was a domestic violence incident. Some neighbours reported hearing gunshots, but didn't realise they were tied to the fatal shooting nearby until deputies arrived. During the investigation, authorities identified Kelvin as a suspect. Investigators said that Kelvin fled the scene of the slaying, ditched his car at a nearby store on Airline Highway, and then ran into a neighbourhood. A resident spotted Kelvin trying to steal a car, and with the help of the neighbour, wrestled him to the ground until deputies arrived. Kelvin was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. Possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, unauthorized entry, simple burglary, felony theft of a motor vehicle, and illegal use of weapons. He's had at the Ascension Parish Jail without bond. Kelvin is a convicted felon with prior history of firearm, drug and criminal damage charges and allegations of firing a gun into property. He was on probation for some of those past convictions and had a bench warrant issued for his arrest for missing a mandated court date in Ascension Parish five days prior to the killings. The investigation into the matter continues. 45-year-old Mark Terry is behind bars for fatally beating his 81-year-old mother Marty Terry during an argument inside their home. At around 8am on Sunday the 14th of January, authorities responded to their apartment at 2021 Brooks Drive 
in District Heights, Maryland after Mark called 911 and told dispatch that he went to check on his mother that morning when he found her unresponsive. When officers arrived, they found Marty deceased inside the living room with bruises and trauma to her body, with her clothes ripped apart. Authorities identified Marty as son who lived with his mother as a suspect, and he was taken into custody. During an interview with detectives, Mark admitted that he fatally assaulted his mother during a dispute. He said that he got upset when his mother confronted him about his drinking habits. He said he pushed his mother to the ground and started hitting her in the body and face with her own cane. She begged him to please stop, but he continued striking her with it. The homicide occurred on Thursday the 11th of January, but Mark didn't call authorities until the morning of Sunday the 14th of January. Mark was arrested and charged with first and second degree murder, as well as other related charges. He remains held at the Prince George County Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. A man is behind bars after authorities discovered one man killed and another hanging from a tree. At 6.59pm on Monday the 15th of January, authorities responded to a residence at 5327 Elkin Avenue in Spring Hill, Florida to conduct a welfare check on 44-year-old William Scott Trudel. A family member called 911 to report that 24-year-old Dakota Lee Croft had possibly killed William. Upon arrival, deputies made contact with 33-year-old Dustin McMillan. Dustin initially locked the front door and prevented deputies from entering the premises. Eventually, Dustin allowed deputies inside, but indicated that Dakota was not home. Another deputy who walked to the backyard found Dakota deceased hanging from a tree. Deputies then conducted a search of the surrounding area, where they located William's body lying on the ground in a nearby wooded lot. Deputies located drag marks from the side garage door of the residence to where William's body was located. During questioning, Dustin advised that he and Dakota had purchased alcohol earlier that day and had been drinking and they devised a plan to attack William. Dustin said Dakota was upset with William for being a cop caller and disrespecting women in the home. Dustin advised when William entered the garage, they ambushed him and killed him. A family member entered the garage a short time later and saw William's body lying on the floor. That family member immediately left the premises. Dustin said that he and Dakota proceeded to drag William's body to a nearby wooded area and then began to clean up the garage and dispose of any evidence. Further investigation revealed Dakota was currently under supervision of the Florida Department of Corrections and had recently cut off his ankle monitor, which was located in the backyard. Detectives believe it was shortly after that that both men attempted to clean up the garage, but Dakota then hanged himself. Dustin was arrested and charged with one count of first degree murder and tampering with evidence. He remains held at the Hernando County Detention Center without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 60-year-old James Anderson has been arrested after driving drunk and smashing into a police car. At around 7.15pm on Monday the 15th of January, James struck a police cruiser while its emergency lights were activated and parked for traffic control at the intersection of 18th Avenue South and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Street South in St. Petersburg, Florida. Investigators said the officer suffered minor injuries and was transported to a local hospital for treatment. The driver was determined to be impaired and was also found to be in possession of fentanyl. James was arrested and charged with DUI involving property damage, driving on a suspended license, and possession of fentanyl. The investigation into the matter continues. 19-year-old Jada Marie Ray is behind bars for stabbing a man outside a bar. At 12.05am on Sunday the 14th of January, Authorities responded to Little Bobby's Bar and Grill in McIntosh, Minnesota on reports of a stabbing. When officers arrived, they found a man lying on the ground outside the bar in below zero temperatures. He had at least 20 stab wounds on his face, arm, shoulder and lower back. Witnesses at the bar told police they saw Jaden stab the man until he fell to the ground. The victim was taken to Essential Hospital in Fargo with non-life-threatening injuries. The victim was reportedly involved in an altercation with two other men prior to being stabbed. While interviewed by detectives, Jaden admitted to holding a knife to the victim's neck outside of the bar. She said that she pushed the knife harder than she intended to and cut the victim, and stabbed him three or four more times before running away. She said she returned to find the victim in the pool of blood, but said she does not remember stabbing him more than three or four times. Jaden was arrested and booked into the Polk County Jail on charges of attempted murder, first degree assault, 
and causing great bodily harm to another. The investigation into the matter continues. Four people were behind bars in connection to the death of a three-year-old girl who died from abuse. At just before 4am on Saturday the 13th of January, 33-year-old Kiri Ann Santos arrived at the University of New Mexico Hospital with her three young children, including an unresponsive three-year-old girl who was wrapped in a blanket. Kiri Ann said she left Massachusetts and was travelling through New Mexico and noticed her daughter was sick. She said she stopped by a gas station in Albuquerque so her daughter could use the restroom, but she fell from the toilet and injured herself. She said she started driving again and followed signs and drove to the hospital. Hospital staff determined the three-year-old girl was deceased upon arrival and called police. Authorities were suspicious of the story Carrie Ann provided and noted the girl had several bruises on her body that were in different stages of healing. She also had ligature marks across both ankles. As a result of the signs of abuse, Albuquerque Police Department's crimes against children detectives were called to investigate. Detectives worked through the day and that night to determine the circumstances that led to the child's death. They placed the other two children on a 72-hour hold with the Children, Youth and Families Department. They also learned from law enforcement in Massachusetts that there were multiple police reports of domestic violence and an investigation by Child, Youth and Families Department about suspicion of Carrie Ann using drugs around her children. A forensic interview was conducted on the older sibling of the deceased child, and detectives learned that two other adults, 46-year-old Christina Pina Cantor and her son, 28-year-old Austin Bing, drove with Carrie Ann and her three children to Albuquerque. Detectives also discovered the children, including the three-year-old girl, were sexually molested. Detectives learned that one of the adults would tie the three-year-old girl at the ankles and wrists with shoelaces. The two families arrived in Albuquerque in recent days and stayed in an apartment with another man, James Welch. Kiri Ann eventually told detectives the abuse and injuries to the three-year-old girl occurred at James's residence. Detectives secured a search warrant at James's home at 2103 Gold Avenue Southeast, collected evidence and subsequently arrested Kiri Ann, James, Christina and Austin. Kiri Ann's been charged with two counts of child abuse resulting in great bodily harm, one count of child abuse resulting in death, and tampering with evidence. James, Christina and Austin face two counts of child abuse. All four have been held without bond at the Bernalillo County Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. 50-year-old Thomas Delgado is behind bars and is accused of murder, rape and kidnapping during a home invasion in 2013. Authorities said they were able to identify Thomas as one of two masked men who broke into 48-year-old Joseph Canizara's home at 321 Swartley Road in Hilltown Township, Pennsylvania at just after 6am on the 18th of January 2013. The men entered the home through the window of a master bedroom and were armed with handguns and bound Joseph and his fiancée with zip ties. After Joseph's 12-year-old son entered the bedroom, one of the men put a knife to the boy's throat and bound him with zip ties as well. The men then led Joseph through the house ransacking it, taking guns, money, jewellery and other items. One of the suspects later identified as Thomas, raped the woman while she was tied up on the floor. The suspects then took off with Joseph's 2006 black pickup truck. Shortly after the men left, the woman managed to free herself and then the boy from their restraints. She hid the boy in the basement and went looking for Joseph, but was unable to find him. She tried using a cordless phone to ring 911, but the phone was dead. She then drove the boy to a friend's house so she could call police. When officers arrived at Joseph's residence, they found him laying face down in the garage with his hands still bound, dead with multiple stab wounds. Joseph's pickup truck was later found abandoned behind a restaurant at the Quaker Town Plaza shopping centre. Police obtained surveillance footage from the shopping centre parking lot, which showed that shortly before 10am that same morning, the suspects were seen moving stolen items from the bed of the pickup to the red Nissan sedan parked next to it. Both men then got into the Nissan and drove off. DNA recovered from a mask found in the stolen truck as well as from a rope kit from the sexual assault were linked back to Thomas. Authorities said the attack was a targeted one. A warrant for Thomas's arrest was issued in December of 2023. On Wednesday the 10th of January 2024, the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force located Thomas in the 2600 block of Collins Street in Philadelphia and arrested him. He faces 28 felony charges including homicide, rape, robbery, burglary, kidnapping, criminal conspiracy and other related charges. He remains held at the Bucks County Correctional Facility with bail denied. Investigators said that at the time of the killing, Joseph owed millions to creditors, including several casinos, and detectives said that cell phone records indicate that he had been in touch with Thomas several times in 2011. Authorities said that the female victim reported that the larger of the two men 
who've identified as Thomas, told the couple who've been staking at the house for weeks from the nearby woods. We know you have the money, just give us the money, he said. District Attorney Jen Sean said it would be wrong to call this a cold case. These detectives have spent more than a decade seeking justice for these victims. Like they always do, detectives never relented in the pursuit for justice, and now were able to announce an arrest. Police said they are still working to identify the second suspect. The investigation into the matter continues. A 38-year-old man is behind bars for abusing a child. On Friday the 12th of January, authorities arrested a former Jefferson Town paramedic in Louisville, Kentucky. Marshal Alexander Atherton is charged with rape, incest, sodomy, and two counts of sexual abuse of a victim under the age of 12. Marshal was held at the Shelby County Detention Center on a $100,000 bond. Jefferson Town Fire Protection District Chief Sean Drysback said that Marshall resigned from the department on the 7th of December 2023 and is no longer associated with them. Marshall is scheduled to be back in court on the 6th of March. The investigation into the matter continues. Forty-five-year-old Sean Dale Maxwell is behind bars for fatally shooting forty-five-year-old Shannon Mansfield at 5:43 p.m. on Monday, the 15th of January. Authorities responded to a residence in Haldville, Missouri on reports of a woman shot. When deputies arrived, they found 45-year-old Shannon Mansfield unresponsive inside her apartment with a gunshot wound. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Following further investigation, deputies located the suspect Shondale Maxwell and a weapon in a nearby apartment. Shondale was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and armed criminal action. He's headed at the Mississippi County Jail with no bond. The motive of the killing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. A 22-year-old woman is behind bars for killing her younger sister inside their home. At around 10.30pm on Tuesday the 16th of January, authorities responded to a residence in the 2200 block of Beaver Dam Road in Enfield, North Carolina on reports of a missing 10-year-old girl. When deputies arrived, they learned that the mother located the missing child deceased in the backyard with multiple stab wounds. Investigators determined that 22-year-old Kanae Josiah Bradley stabbed a 10-year-old sister inside their home and moved the child's body outside to the rear of the property. Kanae was arrested and charged with murder and remains out of the Halifax County Jail without bond. Family members described the victim as a kind girl who excelled in school. Halifax County Sheriff's Office Captain Scott Hall said, It's tragic when a life is cut short especially a child. It's so heart-wrenching. When deputies pull on scene and find an incident like this, it's hard on everyone involved, including the family and all responders. This is such a sad incident. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family, he said. Kenoja has a criminal history and several pending cases in Halifax County. On the 22nd of April 2023, she was arrested for assault inflicting serious injury against a law enforcement officer and last near of a motor vehicle. That court date is set for the 29th of January. On the 27th of August 2023, she was arrested for simple assault, assault with a deadly weapon against a law enforcement official, and resisting arrest. That court date is set for the 24th of February. Canage's first court appearance for a sister's murder is scheduled for the 25th of January. The investigation into the matter continues. A 47-year-old man is behind bars for murdering his 42-year-old girlfriend. Police said that around 5am on Wednesday the 17th of January, officers found Amaris Morales Berrios deceased on a bed at their home at 1117 Priority Road in York, Pennsylvania. She was wrapped in a comforter with boxes piled on top of her. She had been stabbed with a knife and had trauma to her throat and there was a large amount of blood. Amaris was reported missing by family on the 15th of January and was last seen at her home at around 11pm on the 13th of January. During the investigation, detectives identified 47-year-old Jose Rodriguez Ramos as a suspect. Authorities said that Jose had been Amaris' living boyfriend for four years. Police believe an argument that occurred on Saturday night on the 13th of January sparked the domestic-related homicide. Witnesses told investigators that Jose is extremely violent and jealous. One witness had seen Jose make a slashing movement over his throat while the pair argued, and family members told police that he had threatened to slit her throat many times. Investigators said that Jose contacted numerous family members and told them he had killed Amaris by slashing her throat. 
Detectives said they were told Amaris never left home without letting her family know where she was going and was always in constant contact with her three children. Jose was arrested and charged with criminal homicide and is held at the York County Jail with bail denied. The investigation into the matter continues. A 69-year-old retired Kentucky police officer faces rape and sodomy charges after having sex with a juvenile girl on multiple occasions. David Roy Love of Radcliffe was arrested on Thursday the 4th of January following an investigation by the Kentucky State Police. While questioned, David admitted to having a sexual relationship with a 14-year-old girl. The abuse began in early October 2023 when the girl was just 13 years old. The former cop said he received and performed oral sex, engaged in other sexual acts, and even purchased a sex toy for their use during two or more encounters with the victim. He also confessed to having porn on his personal tablet and to sending porn through Facebook. He later deleted it to hide evidence. David was charged with second degree rape, second degree sodomy, and tampering with evidence. He was held at the Hardin County Detention Centre, but was released on the 5th of January after posting a partially secure $25,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 37-year-old man has died after being shot during a burglary attempt. At around 3am on Saturday the 13th of January, authorities responded to a residence on Strawberry Lane in Quilly, Missouri in reference to a man being shot. When deputies arrived, they were told that an intruder had tried to break into the residence when the homeowner had shot the suspect five times. The suspect, identified as 37-year-old Darren Veneman of Chanute, Kansas, was critically injured and was flown to Memphis Hospital for treatment. On the morning of Tuesday, the 16th of January, Darren died from his injuries. Authorities said that the homeowner faces no charges as the shooting was deemed a justifiable act of self-defense. The parents of a three-month-old boy who died from neglect and malnourishment have been indicted on multiple felony charges. On Thursday the 18th of January, a grand jury in McLennan County, Texas indicted 33-year-old Skyling Catherine Chuick and 27-year-old Charles Devon Harris on charges of murder, injury to a child, endangering a child and possession of meth. At around 8am on Wednesday the 29th of November, Authorities found the couple's baby son, Jacob, unresponsive in the filthy room at the New Road Inn Motel at 4000 Interstate 35 North Frontage Road in Waco, Texas. Investigators said the baby was starving and looked like a skeleton. He died later that day at a local hospital. A doctor told police the boy died as a result of starvation because he was very malnourished and possibly shaken baby syndrome due to injuries he observed. Child Protective Services workers received a report that Jacob weighed 7 pounds when he was born, but only weighed 10 pounds when he died. The person who reported the situation to Child Protective Services claimed that Skylin was nonchalant about the baby's condition and that Charles was playing video games the entire time during the person's visit to their room. Police responded the day after the report to Child Protective Services and found the family living in unclean and dangerous conditions, describing the boy as very thin and malnourished. Child Protective Services workers took custody of his three-year-old sister. Officers also found half a gram of meth and a drug scale in a backpack next to a motel room bed. They also saw cockroaches in the area where one of the children slept and numerous knives and swords with blades exposed within the reach of the three-year-old girl. Investigators said they found no real food for the children and there was no baby formula for Jacob. The only food found for the children were a couple of juice boxes and fruit snacks. Charles and Charlene are held at the McLennan County Jail. Charles is held on a $57,000 bond, and Skylin was given a $55,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A Paducah, Kentucky man and his grandmother are behind bars for their involvement in the sexual abuse of a minor. Authorities said that 24-year-old James Robinson gave the female juvenile relative marijuana and then initiated sexual contact with her. After learning about the allegations against James, deputies found out that James's grandmother, 78-year-old Aretha Jeanette Snow, was also a caretaker for the minor. She allegedly knew about the abuse, but failed to report it. On Wednesday the 10th of January, authorities arrested James with incest with a person less than 18, first degree rape and second-degree unlawful transaction with a minor. James reportedly has a lengthy criminal history, 
and was on parole at the time of his arrest. Aretha was also arrested and charged with failure to report child abuse. They both held at the McCracken County Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. A 20-year-old man has been charged with capital murder after fatally beating an elderly man during a robbery. On the 12th of December, deputies responded to a residence at 11220 US Highway 84 West in Wicksburg, Alabama and found 70-year-old Durwood Ard severely beaten and deceased outside his home. His death was ruled a homicide. Investigators collected evidence and submitted it to the state crime lab. On Thursday the 18th of January, Officials received the lab results which showed the DNA collected from the crime scene matched that of 20-year-old Justin Ryan Ammons and charged him with capital murder during robbery. Authorities said that Justin had always been considered a prime suspect in Durwood's killing, however they could not charge him with murder until forensic results came back. Justin remained held at the Houston County Jail since the day of the killing on pickpocketing charges. Houston County Sheriff Donald Valencia said that Justin and Durwood knew each other prior to the killing and that Justin was most likely homeless at the time. He said that Durwood suffered severe extreme skull fractures and structural damage to his skull and was deceased for about 12 hours before his daughter found his body. Sheriff Valenza said that this was one of the most brutal murders he's ever seen in his 45 years in law enforcement. Justin remains held without bond and if convicted of Durwood's murder, he faces a death penalty. The investigation into the matter continues. A delivery driver has been killed by a naked man who fatally beat him with firewood he was delivering. At 1.28pm on Saturday the 13th of January, authorities responded to a residence along Wendover Drive in Fort Worth, Texas on multiple calls of an assault. When officers arrived, they found 57-year-old Scotty Jackson in the front yard with severe blunt force trauma to his head and neck. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Scotty was hired by the homeowner to deliver firewood in the freezing conditions. He arrived and was unloading the logs when he was approached by a naked man, later identified as 27-year-old Chris Antos Armandi. Chris Antos was renting a room at an Airbnb nearby on the same street. The homeowner, whose name remains anonymous, told authorities that Chris Antos was acting belligerent and extremely violent. He said this naked man is three inches from my face, holding a key up to me yelling at me I was on his property. He never wants to see me again. I should leave, the homeowner recalled. Scotty then replied, No, this is his property in his house. Just let us unload the firewood because it's cold outside. Chris Antis then pushed the homeowner and struck Scotty with a piece of wood repeatedly and then eventually dumped a wheelbarrow on top of him. Chris Antis then chased the homeowner into the house before returning to Scotty and beating him with logs until he was dead. The homeowner said, I fully believe with my whole heart that he was out to murder both of us. Once the deadly attack was over, Chris Antis returned to the Airbnb where he was staying and threatened a woman renting another room in the same home who was doing laundry. The woman said Chris Antis was hollering at her and saying, I'll beat your ass, I'm gonna fuck you up, while trying to force his way into her room. She managed to get safely inside a bathroom. We also attempted to force entry until police arrived. Police confronted the naked man, who was described as non-compliant and aggressive. As officers directed Chris Antis to exit the home, he came out yelling. Ultimately, police deployed a taser on the suspect and took him into custody. According to neighbours, Chris Antis had recently rented a room at the Airbnb just a few days prior to their fatal attack on Scotty. Scotty's daughter, Casey De Leon, feared something was wrong Saturday when her father failed to return home. I remember telling my boyfriend something is wrong. My dad always calls me, she said. I'll never be able to call my dad again. I'll never be able to see him. At this moment, I have so much hate and so much anger. I just hope that justice is served. That's all I want for my dad, she said. Chris Antis has a criminal history, including evading arrest. Last year, he held a security guard at gunpoint in Tarrant County. Chris Antis has been charged with murder, aggravated assault of a security guard, and obstruction. He's been held at the Tarrant County Jail on a $312,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 34-year-old man is behind bars for multiple felony sex acts committed against a minor female relative in Jackson, Missouri. On Wednesday the 10th of January, the Jackson Police Department opened an investigation involving accusations of possible child molestation. Devin Campbell of Marble Hill was arrested and charged with first-degree statutory rape, two counts of first-degree statutory sodomy and incest. 
He's held at the Cape Girardeau County Jail on a $75,000 cash only bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Four people face drug charges following a traffic stop. At just after 2pm on Wednesday the 17th of January, authorities stopped a vehicle along Lone Oak Road, near Interstate 24 in Paducah, Kentucky for traffic infractions. Deputies determined that the driver of the vehicle, 36-year-old Warren Brown, was under the influence of illegal drugs. He also faces charges of no registration plates and operating a motor vehicle under the influence of drugs first offence. The three passengers, 31-year-old Kelly Johnson, 30-year-old James Mitchell and 38-year-old Matthew Lawson were also arrested for drug possession after a search of the vehicle revealed meth and drug paraphernalia. Kelly also has an outstanding bench warrant for contempt of court. All four suspects were taken to the McCracken County Regional Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. A 26-year-old man is behind bars for illegal drug and gun possession charges. On the morning of Friday, the 19th of January, deputies from the Marin County Sheriff's Office searched Caesar de Villa's vehicle near the intersection of Pine and Silver Roads in Silver Spring Shores, Florida, after he ran a stop sign. In the car, they found meth and a trafficking amount of fentanyl and an illegal gun. Authorities said that Caesar refused to be handcuffed and would not hand over his car keys. Marin County Sheriff's deputies arrested Caesar on charges of trafficking fentanyl resisting arrest and two charges of possession of an illegal gun. Caesar also had an active warrant out of Alachua County. He's been held without bond at the Marin County Sheriff's Office. The investigation into the matter continues. 20-year-old Tyler Prince is behind bars for fatally beating his mother Jessica Girth. On Wednesday the 10th of January, Tyler called 911 to request an ambulance stating that his mother had fallen in a home in Arlington, Kentucky, and needed medical attention. Medics arrived and transported Jessica to Mercy Health, Paducah. Doctors advised police that Jessica suffered suspicious multiple injuries on her body that were inconsistent with the reported fall that appeared to be from abuse. Injuries were so severe that she was transported to a trauma center in Tennessee, where she was listed in a critical condition. Kentucky State Police began investigating the incident, which included interviewing other members of Jessica's household. As a result of the investigation, Tyler was arrested and charged with first-degree assault and was booked into the Ballard County Jail. Two days later, on Friday the 12th of January, Jessica died from her injuries and Tyler was additionally charged with murder domestic violence. Authorities discovered that on the 6th of January, Tyler kicked Jessica in the head about eight times during an argument. It was also noted that Jessica received multiple facial fractures along with other internal injuries and had to be intubated before her passing. On Thursday the 18th of January, a grand jury indicted Tyler on the assault and murder charges. Tyler remains held at the Ballard County Jail in a $250,000 bond. His next court appearance is set for the 7th of March. The investigation into the matter continues. 64-year-old David Franklin Wolf is behind bars and faces multiple felony charges related to the sexual abuse of an 11-year-old girl. A Department of Children and Families investigator in Gainesville, Florida responded to a call about a girl being hit in the head by a mother. While investigating the incident, she received information about sexual activity involving the girl and a neighbor. On Thursday the 18th of January, the investigator interviewed the 11-year-old girl who said that David a neighbor had sexually battered her every day for at least six months. She said he gave her money and let her play with his PlayStation 4. The investigator also reported that she saw scarring on the girl's wrist, and the girl said that David would wrap a rubber band, which she caught a rope around her wrist so tightly that it caused injury. She said that if she refused to engage in sexual activity, he twisted it tighter and sometimes used the rubber band around her wrist to restrict her movements. She said it was extremely painful. The girl said that David exposed himself to her, and once cut her on the thigh with a knife. The victim's mother told the investigator that her daughter went to David's apartment alone almost every day. She said she had known for about two months that David was touching her daughter inappropriately, but the investigator reported that the girl's mother never reported this to the authorities. The victim said her mother told her that if the Department of Children and Families opened a case, she would be taken away from her mother. David is a registered sex predator who was previously convicted twice for possession of child porn, as well as lewd and lascivious behavior. 
The victim's mother told the investigator that she knew that David was a sex offender, but believed he was only attracted to boys. Gainesville Police Department officers went to David's apartment that same day to arrest him. David pulled away and tried to run after being restrained by officers. He continued to resist, but eventually complied. David's charge was sexual battery on a victim under 12, lewd or lascivious molestation on a victim under 12, aggravated child abuse, human trafficking for sex, luring or enticing a child, and resisting an officer without violence. He's held at the Alachua County Jail with bail set at $1,955,000. The investigation into the matter continues. 28-year-old Tyler James Daisy is behind bars for killing his 46-year-old mother Jennifer Ann Daisy and their pet dog. At around 8.50am on Thursday the 18th of January, a friend of Jennifer contacted authorities after finding a body in the bedroom of a home at 1605 Avoca Street in Dubuque, Iowa. When police arrived at the residence, they found Jennifer deceased with two of her fingers severed from her hand and she had significant lacerations to her head, face and neck. They also found the family dog dead from injuries to its head lying on the living room sofa, and a tactical tomahawk in the bathroom, and its sheath on the dining room table. Police then located Ty laying naked in his room, and was not overly responsive to officers. He was transported to Mercy One Dubuque Medical Center for evaluation, and was later released into police custody. During an interview, Tyler told detectives that the tomahawk was his, and that he kept it in a toolbox in his bedroom. He also claimed his mother was practicing witchcraft against him and had been doing so for years. When directly asked about Jennifer's injuries, Tyler invoked his right to remain silent. Tyler was charged with first degree murder and animal abuse causing death and is held at the Dubuque County Jail. On the morning of Friday the 19th of January, he appeared at the Dubuque County Courthouse via video. The judge Mark Hostager set Tyler's bond at $2 million. Upon hearing this, Tyler began to laugh and told the judge it was always a pleasure before being laid away. The investigation into the matter continues. 66-year-old Jerry Lynn Israel is accused of killing her 42-year-old son John Allen Gaither. At 5.43pm on the 22nd of December, authorities responded to Jerry's residence at 2201 16th Avenue in Gulfport, Mississippi in reference to a welfare concern for John who was reported as a possible missing person. Throughout the week, after conducting several follow-ups, detectives began noticing contradictions in Jerry's statements. She also became increasingly uncooperative and changed her statements multiple times. During the course of the investigation, Gulfport police learned that Jerry had been convicted of killing a woman in Florida in 1995 and driving around with a body in the trunk of a car for several days before dumping it in Indian River County. Armed with that information, at 10 a.m. on the 18th of January, Authorities executed a search warrant on Jerry's home. At this time, Jerry consumed an unsafe amount of pills while detectives conducted a search of the residence, and she was transported to a local hospital for medical treatment. Detectives continued their search and found John's body in a large six-foot-long wooden box, described by authorities as a military locker-style container, which was located behind a false wall. Police said that Jerry attempted to cover up the murder by writing notes to family members posing as her son. On Saturday the 20th of January, Jerry was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Jerry was taken to the Harrison County Adult Detention Centre, where she's been held without bond. Neighbours of Jerry said she seemed to be a nice person, making casual small talk and keeping to herself. They also mentioned the same could be said about John, who was often seen working on cars outside the home. Police have not released a cause of death, and the motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A 34-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting a 33-year-old woman in a domestic violence-related homicide. At just after 8pm on Friday the 19th of January, authorities responded to the intersection of Central and Kenyon Avenues in Portucket, Rhode Island on reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive woman laying on the sidewalk with gunshot wounds. She was pronounced dead at the scene. The woman was identified as 33-year-old Jocelyn Ducoto. Authorities said that Jocelyn had just left her work at a hair braiding salon at 440 Central Avenue when she was shot several times in the head from point-blank range. Witnesses reported seeing a grey SUV fleeing the scene following the shooting. During the investigation, detectives learned that the incident appeared to be domestic-related and identified 34-year-old Michael Fernandez as a suspect. Michael was located and arrested later that night. Michael's charged with domestic murder, 
discharge of a firearm resulting in death, carrying a pistol without a license, large capacity feeding device prohibited, and domestic violation of a no contact order. Jocelyn is survived by two young children. The investigation into the matter continues. A 47-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting a 34-year-old man at a motel. At just before 2.30pm on Friday the 19th of January, authorities responded to Motel 6 at 1585 Monroe Drive in Gainesville, Georgia on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived, they found a man in a critical condition with a gunshot wound to his chest. He was transported to Northeast Georgia Medical Center, where he later died. The victim was identified as 34-year-old Destin Rashad Alexander of Brasalton. Upon further investigation, authorities identified 47-year-old Corey Maurice Rucker as a suspect in the shooting. Police said that the victim and the suspect were known to each other, but did not elaborate on their relationship. Investigators said that Corey fled the scene in Destin's Burgundy Nissan Murano before police arrived. At around 4am on Saturday the 20th of January, Authorities developed information which led them to a motel in DeKalb County, where Corey was arrested without incident. He is charged with felony murder, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime, and theft of a motor vehicle. Corey is held at the Hall County Jail without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 41-year-old Jenna Marie Rutherford is behind bars for fatally shooting a 48-year-old man. The shooting occurred at around 8am on Friday the 19th of January in room 122 of the Super 8 Motel, located at 9125 Old Highway 6 in Santee, South Carolina, where Jenna lived and worked. Authorities responded to the scene on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived at the motel, they found 48-year-old Douglas Malcolm Strock of Micanopy Court in Santee deceased with a gunshot wound. Jenna confessed to shooting Douglas, and she was arrested. During her arraignment later that day, Jenna said the shooting wasn't done intentionally with any malice. It was an accident, she insisted. It was a tug and pull. I heard a bang, smelled it. I called immediately, she said. Investigators said that Douglas and Jenna were involved in a series of domestic incidents that began the previous day and claim that the shooting was intentional. It's unclear what the incidents were about, or how Douglas and Jenna knew each other. Jenna's charged with murder, and possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. She's held at the Orangeburg County Jail without bond. At the time of her arrest, Jenna was already out on a personal recognizance bond for third degree assault and battery, by mob charge stemming from a December 2022 incident. On the 27th of February 2017, Jenna pleaded guilty to possession of heroin, and on the 9th of August 2017, to shoplifting valued at $2,000 or less. The investigation into the matter continues. A HIV-positive youth baseball coach is behind bars for repeatedly raping a 12-year-old girl. On the night of Saturday the 13th of January 2024, 39-year-old Donovan Scott Shepard got into a fight at a bar in Moore, Oklahoma. He was taken home by a woman who lived with him at their residence in southwest Oklahoma City. Authorities said that the young girl was asleep in another room of the house at the time of the incident. The girl's mother awoke to find Donovan raping the girl in her room. The woman held Donovan at gunpoint and contacted police. When officers arrived at the scene, they took Donovan into custody. Donovan told officers that he's HIV positive and was not wearing a condom when he raped the girl. Police interviewed the young female victim, who said this wasn't the first time that Donovan sexually assaulted her. She said it occurred multiple times, even occurring once on her 12th birthday. She said that he raped her, adding that the abuse occurred six times. Donovan was charged with two counts of lewd molestation, rape by instrumentation, three counts of first degree rape of a minor under 14, exposing others to AIDS, and pattern of criminal offences. He's out of the Cleveland County Jail on a $500,000 bond. Donovan coached a youth baseball team called Oklahoma Aftermath for several years. It's unclear if there are any other victims. The investigation into the matter continues. A 22-year-old woman is behind bars for stabbing a 20-year-old woman. At 12.27am on Saturday the 20th of January, authorities responded to the 300 block of West 4th Street 
In Nalmara, New York, on reports that a femur had been stabbed, when officers arrived at the scene, they were met with a disturbance between two groups of people yelling at each other from houses that were across the street from one another. Officers entered one of the homes and found a woman with a stab wound to her back and other injuries to her face. Paramedics arrived and treated the victim on scene before rushing her to the Robert Packer Hospital with severe non-life-threatening injuries. Authorities discovered that the stabbing occurred at a separate nearby residence from the one that the victim was found in. During the investigation, authorities identified 22-year-old Aniston Wheeler as a stabbing suspect. She was arrested and charged with second-degree assault and is out at the Chemin County Jail on a $50,000 cash bail. The motive of the stabbing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. 72-year-old Richard Allen Holtham is behind bars for child sex crimes. Authorities said he engaged in sexual activities with a child between the ages of 4 and 6 in 2021. At 8.36pm on Thursday the 18th of January 2024, Richard was arrested at his home at 117 Waterfall Court in Cary, North Carolina. He was booked into the Wake County Jail and charged with four felony counts of statutory sex offence with a child by an adult. He appeared in court on Friday the 19th of January, where his bond was set at $1 million. His next court appearance is scheduled for the 8th of February. The investigation into the matter continues. A 46-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting his 25-year-old ex-girlfriend. At 6.24am on Saturday the 20th of January 2024, Authorities responded to a distress call reporting a body had been found next to a dumpster at 3994 South 300 West in Mill Creek, Utah. Officials identified the female victim as 25-year-old Esperanza Chavez. She had a gunshot wound to her head and her death was ruled a homicide. As police investigated the matter, they found surveillance video from a nearby business that provided them with crucial footage of a black Chevy 1500 pickup truck arriving at the scene at 12.28am earlier that morning. A man was seen pulling a body from the vehicle and attempting to dispose of it in the dumpster, but he ultimately left the body beside the dumpster before leaving the scene. Through the security footage, detectives were able to identify the license plate number of the vehicle and track it back to 46-year-old Fred Jason Edwards. Authorities said that they believe Fred shot and killed Esperanza in the vehicle before dumping her body. Police said that they believe the incident to be a culmination of elongated domestic violence history between Fred and Esperanza. At 1.03pm that same day, authorities found Fred at the University of Utah Psychiatric Hospital, where he was attempting to admit himself. He was located in the waiting room, and he was taken into custody. He was charged with first-degree murder, obstruction of justice, and abuse or desecration of a dead human body. He was booked into the Salt Lake County Jail, where he's been ordered held without bail. Fred has multiple prior instances of domestic violence against Esperanza. In September of 2020, Esperanza entered a 7-Eleven in West Valley City with a bloody mouth screaming to call 911 because Fred was going to kill her. She reported that Fred had become angry with her, punched her and dragged her by the hair to force her into a vehicle. Fred told Esperanza to call her mother because it was the last time she was going to speak to her. Esperanza feared for her life and jumped out of the moving vehicle. Fred was also arrested in November of 2020 for criminal mischief and threatening violence. In that incident, Fred sent a message to his mother, threatening to kill her by chopping her in half if she contacted his probation officer. Authorities say that Fred is a documented King Mafia Disciple gang member. He has a violent criminal history to include many assaults, mayhem, resisting arrest, threats, retaliation against a witness, and escape from custody. The investigation into the matter continues. 28-year-old Jacob Ray Wallace is behind bars for fatally shooting his girlfriend, 27-year-old Tiffany J. Dickinson. The incident occurred at just before 11pm on Sunday the 21st of January at a home at 554 Freeport Avenue North in St. Petersburg, Florida after Jacob shot and killed Tiffany during an argument. It's unclear what the argument was about. The couple lived in the home with Jacob's 67-year-old mother and two children, a 10-year-old boy and a 23-month-old girl. They were all home at the time of the shooting, but no one else was injured. Authorities said that the girl is Jacob and Tiffany's biological daughter. Jacob remained at the house when officers arrived and took him into custody without incident. 
Jacob was booked into the Pinellas County Jail on a second degree murder charge. The investigation into the matter continues. A 50 year old homeless man is behind bars for impersonating a police officer and trying to arrest drill cops. At 12.03pm on Friday the 19th of January, Sean Caudle Brown was seen walking in the middle of the intersection of Rosewell and Powell Ferry Roads in Marietta, Georgia disrupting traffic. When police approached him and tried to speak with him, he pulled out a metal badge with the word Special Police displayed on it and told the officers they were under arrest for assaulting an officer. He then began reading the officers their Miranda rights, but instead of arresting the officers, Sean was the one placed under arrest. Sean was charged with impersonating a police officer, obstruction, terroristic threats, impeding the flow of traffic, pedestrian roadways when sidewalk provided, and giving a false name. He remains held at the Cobb County Jail on a $5,720 bond. 30-year-old Jasmine Johnson is behind bars and is accused of killing her four-month-old daughter. At around 2.10am on Saturday the 20th of January, authorities responded to the Everett Apartments Complex at 3300 Parkside Drive in Rockland, California, after a neighbour called police to report hearing screams coming from inside an apartment. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found an unresponsive infant girl. Medics attempted life-saving measures, but it was too late and the child was pronounced dead at the scene. Police had been called to the apartment hours early at 5pm on Friday the 19th of January by a neighbour who said that Jasmine was acting erratically. The officers who responded did not think the child was in any danger at the time and left. Jasmine was arrested and initially charged with voluntary manslaughter and child assault, but on Tuesday the 23rd of January, her charges were upgraded to premeditated murder and assault on a child causing death. Michael Randolph, a longtime friend of Jasmine, said that she loved her daughter with all her heart and did nothing intentionally to that baby. I just know that since 2004, she did suffer from mental illness, so that's just that. Mental illness is real, and we need to take that into account, he said. Jasmine's friend said that the system failed her. Jasmine remains held at the South Placer County Jail without bail. The infant's cause of death has not been disclosed as the investigation into the matter continues. 39-year-old Brandon Casimir is behind bars and is accused of killing his wife Jamie Casimir. On Monday the 22nd of January, authorities responded to a residence at 103 First Avenue Southwest in Walk-On, Iowa to complete a welfare check. When officers arrived, they found Jamie dead inside her home. Authorities have not stated how Jamie died, but her death was initially labelled as suspicious. Upon further investigation, detectives ruled Jamie's death a homicide and identified Jamie's husband Brandon as a suspect. At 12.54am on Wednesday the 23rd of January, Brandon was located roughly 800 miles away at the Best Western Inn at 5542 East Eisenhower Boulevard in Loveland, Colorado, and he was arrested. He was booked into the Larimer County Jail and charged with first-degree murder. Authorities said that Brandon had been accused of domestic abuse multiple times in the past against Jamie, but the charges were dropped. The motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. An 18-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting a 33-year-old man. At just after 7.30pm on Saturday the 20th of January, Authorities responded to the 1600 block of Running River Road in Garland, Texas on reports of a disturbance with a weapon. When officers arrived on scene, they located a man outside his residence in a critical condition suffering from a gunshot wound. Medics rendered aid and transported the man to a local hospital where he was pronounced dead. The victim was identified as 33-year-old Rontarius Hamilton. Authorities determined that there was an argument between neighbours about a dog which escalated into gunfire. After talking with family members and witnesses, police arrested 18-year-old Isaiah Kellogg for the shooting. Police said Isaiah wasn't involved in the initial dispute and that Rontaris was arguing with one of Isaiah's family members. Isaiah is charged with murder and he's held at the Garland Detention Centre with bond yet to be set. Rontaris is survived by his two children. The investigation into the matter continues. A 32-year-old man is behind bars for fatally stabbing his girlfriend's six-year-old son. 
At around 9.20pm on Tuesday the 23rd of January, authorities responded to a home at 2027 Deering Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland on reports of a domestic-related stabbing. When officers arrived, they found a woman rendering aid to her six-year-old son, Saron O'Neill, who was in a critical condition with seven stab wounds to his back. Medics assisted in providing aid and transported Saron to a local hospital, where he later died. Investigators determined that 32-year-old Alan Gazlicki, the boyfriend of the victim's mother, stabbed the child to death and fled the scene in his vehicle. Police had a description of the car Alan was driving and located him driving about two miles away in the 100 block of Carrollton Avenue. Officers performed a traffic stop when Alan got out of his vehicle and started running, but he was arrested following a short foot pursuit. Alan was booked into the Baltimore Central Booking Intake Facility in a first-degree murder charge. The motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. Authorities are investigating the fatal shooting of a 47-year-old man. At around 2.50am on Monday the 22nd of January, authorities responded to the 5700 block of Chesswood Drive in Knoxville, Tennessee on reports of a shooting inside a home. When officers arrived on scene, they found a deceased man inside the residence with at least one gunshot wound. The victim was identified as 47-year-old Benjamin Valenas. Investigators believe the shooting occurred following a confrontation between Benjamin and another man, who was detained at the scene and questioned by homicide unit detectives. Authorities said that both men were known to each other and that two guns were recovered at the scene. Currently, no charges have been filed in connection to the shooting as the investigation into the matter continues. A couple from Law in Michigan are behind bars for viewing child porn on the internet. On Friday the 19th of January, 43-year-old William Horner and 42-year-old Stacy Horner were each arraigned in the 97th District Court in Houghton County, Michigan on two counts of child sexually abusive material aggravated possession and two counts of using a computer to commit a crime. Michigan State Police said that the Horners were arrested following the investigation, which was initiated when they learned the couple were viewing files of child sexually abusive material on the internet. A search of their residence resulted in digital evidence being seized. If convicted, the Horners face up to 10 years in prison for the child sexually abusive material aggravated possession and 10 years in prison for using a computer to commit a crime. A 44-year-old man is behind bars on burglary and attempted murder charges. Authorities said that on Monday the 22nd of January, a woman protected her three children from a man who broke into a home wielding a knife. Carroll County deputies received a call from the mother's husband, who was at work in Greenwood, Mississippi. The man told deputies that a knife-wielding man was attempting to enter his residence in Gravel Hill, Mississippi, while his wife and three children were hiding in the closet. The father then described the man and the vehicle he was in. When deputies arrived at the premises, the suspect, identified as 44-year-old Steve Lamar Goss Jr., had already driven away. Authorities said that before Steve left, he drove his 2500 GMC pickup truck into the home's dining room after he failed to kick down the front door. Steve then found the family hiding in the large closet. As he entered the closet with a knife in his hand, the woman shot him in the arm. Steve then fled the home. Other deputies responding to the scene found Steve's vehicle in the parking lot of Ace's Grocery and Deli store, located several miles away. As they attempted a felony traffic stop, Steve ran into the business and deputies pursued him. Steve was arrested inside the store and was taken to a local hospital to be treated for his gunshot wound. Steve was out on felony bond for weapons possession at the time of his arrest and has now been charged with four counts of attempted murder and one count of burglary. He remains held at the Carroll Montgomery Regional Correctional Facility with bond denied. The investigation into the matter continues. A 35-year-old woman is wanted for fatally shooting a 48-year-old man. At 3.13pm on Wednesday the 24th of January, authorities responded to a residence in the 900 block of Fleming Avenue near the intersection of Decatur Court and Columbus, George, on reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they found a man in a critical condition suffering from a gunshot wound to his torso. Medics transported the man to Piedmont Columbus Regional, where he later died. The victim was identified as 48-year-old LaCoya Whittlesey, and his death was ruled a homicide. 
Upon further investigation, authorities identified 35-year-old Rwanda Hill as a suspect. Police said that Rwanda remains on the run and is considered armed and dangerous, and have urged anyone with information of her whereabouts to come forward. The motive of the killing and the relationship between Rwanda and Lakoya is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A 27-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting a woman. At around 12.40am on Monday the 22nd of January, authorities responded to 9390 Northwest 27th Avenue in Miami, Florida on reports of a shooting. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive woman outside a family dollar store, bleeding from the back of her head. The victim, who's not been publicly identified, was pronounced dead at the scene. An autopsy determined that the woman died from a gunshot wound to the back of the head and ruled her death a homicide. Investigators reviewed surveillance footage, which showed the suspect, identified as 27-year-old Jalen Leon Bradley, flee the scene of the shooting in his black Kia Optima. On Tuesday, the 23rd of January, Jalen and his vehicle were located in the 8,000 block of Northwest 7th Avenue. Police towed and impounded his car and took Jalen into custody. During an interview with detectives, Jalen confessed to killing the woman and authorities found a box of ammunition in his car. Police have not disclosed whether Jalen and the victim knew each other. Jalen's charge with second degree murder, possession of a firearm or ammunition by a convicted felon, and tampering with physical evidence. He's held at the Turner Guilford Night Correctional Centre without bond. Jalen has a criminal history and has previously been convicted of charges including battery on a law enforcement officer, carrying a concealed weapon and grand theft. The motive of the shooting is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. A 32-year-old woman convicted in December of 2023 of involuntary manslaughter and the 2018 fatal stabbing of a boyfriend during a marijuana-induced psychosis will not face prison time. On Tuesday, the 23rd of January 2024, Ventura County Judge David Worley ordered Bryn Spechka to two years of probation in the stabbing death of 26-year-old Chad Amelia, who also turned the knife on herself and her dog. She must also fulfill 100 hours of community service and raise awareness about the condition, which is medically known as cannabis-induced psychotic disorder. The judge said the sentencing decision was largely in part due to expert testimony from doctors who confirmed Bryn was suffering from psychosis at the time of the attack. Bryn and Chad started dating a few weeks prior to the stabbing. On the night of the 27th of May 2018, she went to his apartment in the 70 block of Megan Place in Thousand Oaks, California, and they took hits out of a bong. She had a bad reaction to the marijuana when she started hallucinating and hearing voices, so she grabbed several knives, threw them at Chad and then stabbed him 108 times. At around 1.15am on the 20th of May 2018, authorities responded to Chad's residence where they found Chad in a pool of blood, and Bryn screaming hysterically with a knife still in her hands. Officers tried to stop her, but she plunged the knife into her own neck. Police ultimately deployed a taser and used a baton to get the serrated bread knife out of her hands. Bryn suffered stab wounds to her face, neck, and right jugular vein, which needed to be treated with surgery. Paramedics pronounced Chad dead at the scene. He had stab wounds to his head, face, neck, chest, hands, arms, and organs. Investigators said the body-worn camera footage obtained by officers showed Bryn appeared to be possessed. Psychologist Chris Mahandy said that Bryn's stabbing of her own beloved dog, without any evidence of animal cruelty tendencies, is highly inconsistent with the love of dogs and underscores her level of impairment. Bryn told detectives that after smoking the weed, she started hearing and seeing things that weren't there. She says she was convinced she was dead, so she stabbed Chad as a way to resuscitate herself. She said, I wish I could go back in time and prevent this tragedy from happening. Chad's father said after the verdict that the judge gave everyone in the state of California who smokes marijuana a license to kill someone. A woman is behind bars on multiple charges after robbing a bank. At around 5pm on Wednesday the 24th of January, 19-year-old Catherine Esposito entered the Citizens and Farmers Bank at 7534 Richmond Road in Williamsburg, Virginia and handed an employee a note stating that the bank was being robbed and that she had a gun and a bomb. After the teller handed over thousands of dollars to the suspect, the hold-up alarm was activated and police responded to the scene. Catherine left the bank on foot and went into the wooded area behind the bank before police got there. Police said they were able to get a detailed suspect description and began to search the surrounding area. 
and by 5.30pm, they found a pedestrian matching the suspect's description near the intersection of Richmond and Croker Roads just outside the bank. Catherine was arrested and charged with robbery, use of a firearm in the commission of a felony, and threats to bomb or damage buildings. She remains held at the Virginia Peninsula Regional Jail with bond denied. Police are investigating the fatal shooting of a pregnant woman. At 4.48am on Wednesday the 24th of January, authorities responded to a home at 5305 Norton Place in Toledo, Ohio on reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found a deceased woman inside with multiple gunshot wounds. The victim was identified as 34-year-old Tamisha Jakiria Price, who was eight months pregnant at the time. Her unborn baby, Malaysia Lini Price, died from complications of maternal gunshot wounds. The deaths have been ruled a homicide. Tamisha was a working mother and is survived by two children. Authorities continue searching for those responsible for the killings and have asked anyone with information to come forward. No arrests have been made to date and the motive of the murders is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. A mother is accused of being on a phone for more than 20 minutes while her eight-month-old son drowned in a bathtub. On Friday the 26th of January 2024, 23-year-old Olivia Miller was arraigned on charges of involuntary manslaughter and second-degree child abuse in the death of Asher Johnson. The incident occurred on the 22nd of November 2023, while Olivia was home alone with her infant son at their residence at 4636 16 Mile Road Northwest in Sparta Township, Michigan. During the course of the investigation, Olivia told detectives varying stories. She said she put the baby in the bathtub sitting up with a few inches of water in it. She said she then left the water running while she went to an adjacent room to switch the laundry. She said that when she returned to the bathtub five minutes later, she found Asher floating face up with his face submerged in the water and she attempted life-saving measures. She then called 911. Detectives said that after analysing Olivia's phone usage, she had been using her phone in various capacities for approximately 21 minutes leading up to the baby's death, with the longest break in use being 18 seconds. About four minutes before Olivia called 911, she texted her father, just trying to talk while I have time while Asher's taking a nap. The medical examiner said that Asher had been out of the tub and on the floor for about 20 minutes before deputies arrived, and they arrived seven minutes after the 911 call. Olivia's attorney, Frank Stanley, said there was no indication of intentionality in the boy's death. Just because a tragic event happened, it doesn't mean somebody's criminally responsible for it, he said. Olivia remains held at the Kent County Jail on a $300,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 37-year-old man is behind bars for attempting to kidnap a 5th grade elementary school student while she walked to school. The incident occurred at 7.56am on Friday the 26th of January in the area of North 43rd and West Onyx Avenues in Glendale, Arizona. Authorities said they responded to a call from a young girl and obtained neighbor's surveillance footage, which showed a man making a U-turn in his silver sedan, jump out of his car, and chase the girl along the sidewalk for a short distance before heading back to his car. The girl told police that an unknown adult male attempted to grab her as she walked to Sunset Elementary School nearby. She yelled no and managed to get away. The girl says she noticed the suspect follow her from her apartment. Police tracked the vehicle down and identified the suspect as 37-year-old Joseph Ruiz. The following day, Joseph was arrested and booked into the Maricopa County Jail on kidnapping and crimes against children charges. Joseph has a history of violence and has previously been convicted of aggravated assault after stabbing his mother in the neck. The investigation into the matter continues. A 48-year-old man is behind bars following the death of a two-year-old girl. At around 12.50am on Friday the 19th of January, authorities responded to a home at 1417 Drake Avenue in Centerville, Iowa, on reports of an injured toddler. When officers and medics arrived, they found two-year-old Jenny Marbury critically injured inside the residence. She was taken to Mercy One Hospital in Centerville, and from there airlifted to the University of Iowa Hospital in Iowa City, where she died from her injuries eight days later on the morning of Saturday the 27th of January. At 12.30pm that same day, authorities arrested 48-year-old Roger Gillespie without incident on a charge of child endangerment causing death. 
and booked him into the Appanoose County Jail. Authorities said that Roger was Journey's caretaker at the time she suffered her injuries. It's unclear if Roger and Journey were related, what injuries the girl sustained while he cared for her, or who reported her injuries to law enforcement. No further details have been released, as the investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating after a 27-year-old man was fatally shot in his car at a gas station. At 7.41pm on Thursday the 25th of January, authorities responded to reports of a shooting at the Gulf Gas Station at the intersection of Southwest Evangeline Thruway and East Pinhook Road in Lafayette, Louisiana. When officers arrived, they found a man inside a silver Camaro in a critical condition suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. Officers rendered emergency aid while an ambulance was en route but he died at the scene. The victim was identified as 27-year-old Taj Brassard, and his death was ruled a homicide. No arrests have been made to date, and the motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A couple were behind bars for abusing an 8-year-old girl. At around 6.30pm on Thursday the 25th of January, Megan Rowe answered Lael banging on her front door at her home, at 720 43rd Street in Ashland, Kentucky, to find a young girl covered in bruises. The girl told Megan that she'd been kicked out of her home two houses down the street, and that she was scared. The woman allowed the girl inside her home and called 911. The child said that the injuries were caused by family members Austin and Kayla Frazier. He began pounding on Megan's front door, but she did not answer it. When officers arrived at the scene, they arrested the couple. Police saw bruising on the child's arm and body a deep laceration over her eye, and a burn mark on the palm of her hand. The child told officers that the couple beat her with a metal pipe, forcibly placed her hand on a hot stove, and threw something that hit her in the head. The young girl was taken to the hospital in an ambulance. Doctors said she had several broken bones in various stages of healing. Austin and Kayla are charged with first-degree criminal abuse of a child under 12, and are held at the Boyd County Detention Center with their bond set at $100,000 each. Megan said, I'm so grateful that the child was brave enough to run to a complete stranger's house in the rain and the dark to seek shelter. I'm so glad she was willing to run the risk. She didn't know us. She didn't know whether we would help her and keep us safe, but she tried anyway. That girl was so brave and so courageous, she said. The investigation into the matter continues. The mother and an aunt of a one-year-old girl who died have been arrested. At 3.30pm on Wednesday the 24th of January, police responded to a call about a deceased infant at the Lakeview Manor Apartments at 2322 Forest Avenue in Jackson, Mississippi. A child's mother, 28-year-old Lagoya Haynes, told police that she took her daughter to University of Mississippi Medical Center because she was unresponsive. After interviewing Lagoya, Jackson Police Chief Joseph Wade said the girl was brutally beaten and her death was ruled a homicide. The child has been victimized, he said. The child's been brutally beaten and abused. The child had trauma around her neck. What was so startling and horrendous about this was that the child had possibly been deceased for 10 hours. On Thursday the 25th of January, the gay and the child's aunt, 23-year-old Samara Smith, were arrested and charged with felony child neglect. Authorities said there's a possibility that the charges against the two women may be escalated as the inquiry progresses. They've both been held at the Hines County Jail. Legaya's bond is set at $75,000, and Samara's bond was set at $85,000. A 35-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting his 38-year-old wife inside their home. At around 9am on Saturday the 27th of January, authorities responded to a report of an accidental death at a residence at 26 Rockford Court in Brandon, Mississippi, when officers arrived. They became suspicious about the actual cause of death. Investigators determined that the female victim appeared to have died from a gunshot wound. The woman was identified as 38-year-old Kerry Gorrell, and her death was ruled a homicide. Police arrested Kerry's husband, 35-year-old Tyler Gorrell, and charged him with felony possession of a controlled substance, murder, tampering with evidence, and directing or causing a youth to commit a felony. He's held at the Rankin County Jail on a $2,050,000 bond. Kerry's LinkedIn profile shows she was employed as a customer service manager at Walmart in Brandon, Mississippi. The motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 
A 24-year-old man is behind bars after a 29-year-old man was fatally shot. At just after midnight on Sunday the 28th of January, authorities responded to a house in the 500 block of North College Avenue in Salem, Indiana on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found an unresponsive man lying on the floor with a gunshot wound. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The victim was identified as 29-year-old Jacob Mitchell. Police said that three other people, a man and two women, were at the home at the time of the shooting and were taken in for questioning. During interviews with the three, investigators learned that the shooting was a result of a domestic incident and arrested 24-year-old Blake Henry for his role in the shooting. Blake's charged with murder and is held at the Washington County Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. On Tuesday the 23rd of January 2024, 24-year-old Dylan Dwight Towles was sentenced to 50 years in prison for the 2021 murder of his two-month-old infant daughter. On the 18th of September 2021, authorities responded to Dylan's residence in Spirit Lake, Idaho, after he called 911 stating that his two-month-old daughter was not breathing. When officers arrived on scene, they found the child lying face up and unresponsive on the floor. While attempting life-saving measures, officers observed several injuries on the child, including a large circular bruise on her cheek, a bruise on her right leg, and bite marks on her left forearm, left ankle, and below her knee. She was rushed to a local hospital where she died. When asked about the injuries, Dylan told detectives that he bit the child, shook her pretty violently about 20 times, and played with her legs in an attempt to gain a response from the child after she suddenly became unresponsive. The medical examiner said the infant had blunt force injuries to her head, neck, body and extremities. Fractures were also found on the child's ribs, arm, shoulder and both of her legs. A spinal cord injury was also found on the child in addition to bleeding and swelling of the brain. The medical examiner, however, was unable to determine the cause of death due to the child testing positive for COVID. In December of 2022, the medical examiner sent the autopsy report to the Kootenai County Prosecuting Attorney's Office to consult with medical specialists. After an extensive review, experts determined the child's death was caused by abusive head trauma inflicted on the child, and not COVID. On the 6th of July 2023, the Post Falls Police Department apprehended Dylan on a murder warrant. During questioning, Dylan initially stuck to his original story but he eventually broke down and confessed to shaking the infant to death out of frustration because she would not eat or stop crying. During sentencing on Tuesday the 23rd of January 2024, Judge Barbara Duggan said there's no victim more helpless or innocent than a child in this case. Dylan becomes eligible for parole after serving at least half of his 50-year sentence. In 2019, Dylan was charged with felony injury to a child after engaging in a sexual relationship with a 15-year-old girl. At the time of his daughter's murder, he was on probation for the previous conviction. Twenty-year-old McCabe Bailey Sullivan has been arrested after a toddler's son was found outside their home in freezing conditions. On the morning of Sunday the 28th of January, officers were dispatched to an apartment on Camvic Terrace in Cheviot, Ohio, where they found a three-year-old boy trying to enter the back door of a residence. Police found the boy was only wearing pants and was shivering from the rain coming down. His hands and feet were also bright red from the cold. The boy was taken to a local hospital where police noted he had a dirty diaper and his body temperature was 97 degrees Fahrenheit. McKay was arrested and charged with child endangering. She was booked into the Hamilton County Jail. On Monday the 29th of January, McKay appeared in court with a defense attorney. He said that McKay is not sure how this happened. She was asleep inside. It was 10 a.m. her day off. She's not sure how her son got out. She's very much upset about this, as much as everybody else her attorney stated. A judge allowed her to post 10% of her $10,000 bond to get out of jail. She must wear an electronic monitoring device and also must comply with the Job and Family Services Safety Plan. A 34-year-old man is behind bars for choking his ex-girlfriend and biting off part of her nose. The attack occurred at the victim's apartment in San Antonio, Texas on the 24th of July 2023. Authorities said that David Marin Jr. and his girlfriend had been dating for about seven months 
but had split up about two weeks prior to the incident. David had moved his personal belongings out of the victim's apartment at that time. Investigators said that on the 23rd of July 2023, David tried to call the victim several times only to have those calls ignored. Upset about not receiving a response, David entered the woman's residence through a window at around 1am on the 24th of July after breaking a window and climbing inside. Inside his ex-girlfriend's residence, David came across employment documents indicating that the victim had applied for a job at a strip club. The discovery of the documents angered David, and the two got into a verbal altercation that quickly escalated. David grabbed the victim by the throat and choked her for about 10 seconds, before releasing his grip. The victim then attempted to get to the front door, when David attacked her and grabbed her by the shoulders and bit her in the face, ripping off a chunk of her nose. Following the attack, David fled the scene. The victim was subsequently taken to a hospital, where she was referred to a plastic surgeon. On Friday the 26th of January 2024, David Moran Jr. was arrested and charged with one count of aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury. He is held at the Bear County Jail on a $75,000 bond. This isn't David's first run-in with the law. He was arrested in 2013 and charged with murder, but the case was dismissed because a witness did not show up to testify. David's also accused of attacking the same woman in April of 2022. In that attack, investigators said that David slammed the victim's head into the wall of a shower, choked her and started kicking her multiple times. David was also arrested in September of 2019 for beating his pregnant girlfriend, bashing her head against a wall, kicking her, and telling that he did not want to have a child with her. The victim told police that the attack came after about a year of dating, during which time David would not allow the victim to work or see her friends. He was charged with assault of a pregnant person. That case was dismissed over a missing witness. A 49-year-old man is behind bars for killing his wife after the remains of the missing 39-year-old woman were found inside the back of her SUV. Cassidy Ritchie's family had not heard from her since Saturday the 20th of January 2024 and reported her missing on the 25th of January with the Tulsa Police Department in Oklahoma. Tulsa Police said that Cassidy had been involved in a domestic disturbance not long before her disappearance and believes she may have become a victim of foul play. On Friday the 26th of January, police found Cassidy's light blue 2006 Chrysler Pacifica with off-road debris on it on the side of Highway 412 in Catoosa, Oklahoma, near the I Don't Care Bar and Grill. Authorities said that the car was originally stuck in a ditch sometime between Sunday the 21st of January and Tuesday the 23rd of January when a citizen helped pull the wreck vehicle out. On Saturday the 27th of January, Tulsa police posted that they wanted to speak to the Good Samaritan, who possibly didn't realise that the car was connected to a missing persons case. On the morning of Sunday the 28th of January, police eventually obtained a search warrant for the SUV after it was towed, and discovered Cassidy's body buried beneath clothing and blankets in the back of the vehicle. She had several injuries from blunt force trauma. Investigators identified Cassidy's husband Chris Edward Morland Jr. as a suspect, after he went to the couple's shared home alone sometime between the 21st of January and the 23rd of January. Cassidy married Chris on the 7th of January 2024, and police called their relationship tumultuous. On the 24th of January, Chris was arrested by officers with the Tulsa Police Department on an unrelated warrant out of Medina County, Texas, where he's charged with theft greater than $750, but less than $2,500. On Monday, the 29th of January, Chris was charged with first-degree murder. He remains held at the Tulsa County Jail without bond. In 2021, Chris was charged with assault family violence in connection with his previous wife, but the charge was dismissed in 2023 because the unnamed victim did not cooperate with police and investigators could not find her. In 2019, Chris was arrested after he got into a fight with several residences in Nakona Hills, Texas, after they confronted him about his driving habits where small children were near the street. The investigation into the matter continues. Thirty-five-year-old Brian Demaray is behind bars for fatally shooting his wife, 29-year-old Kayla Demaray. At around 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 28th of December, authorities responded to a home in the 22,000 block of 713th Avenue in Dassel, Minnesota, on reports of a shooting. The Meeker County Sheriff's Office said that Brian rang to tell them that he shot his wife and was requesting a law enforcement response. When deputies arrived, 
They entered the residence and found Kayla deceased with multiple gunshot wounds, and Brian was taken into custody. The Midwest Medical Examiner's Office ruled Kayla's death a homicide. Authorities said that the two children who were home at the time of the shooting were not injured and have since been placed into protective custody. Brian is charged with murder and remains held at the Meeker County Jail, pending his first court appearance on the 2nd of January. The motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. Police are searching for the gunman responsible for fatally shooting 33-year-old Bilal Henry. At around 11.25pm on Thursday the 28th of December, authorities responded to a residence at Regency Townhomes along the 3500 block of Woodhaven Avenue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found Bilal unresponsive a few feet from the front door. He had multiple gunshot wounds to his head and torso and was pronounced dead at the scene. Authorities found several bullet casings both inside and outside the home. Philadelphia Police Chief Inspector Scott Small indicated that at least 13 shots were fired from a semi-automatic weapon or weapons. He said the family stated that they heard Leo knocking at the front door, and when Bilal opened the door to see who it was, they heard multiple gunshots. Clearly the shooters were firing from outside, and then entered and fired multiple shots, hitting the victim in the head and torso, he added. Bilal's wife Sonia and their two boys were upstairs at the home at the time of the shooting. None of the children nor Sonia were injured in the attack. Witnesses told police they saw two men in dark colored clothing fleeing the scene on foot and possibly getting into a white vehicle after the shooting. The attackers are not reported to have stolen anything from the house. Police are reviewing surveillance footage from neighboring homes in the area to help identify the suspects. The motive of the killing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. Three people are behind bars for abducting an 11-year-old girl. On Saturday the 30th of December, authorities issued a silver alert for the kidnapping of Natalia Connett, who was last seen at 3.28pm that day in Zanesville, Indiana, near Stony Creek Estate Mobile Home Park. Wells County Sheriff Scott Holliday said that during the time of her disappearance, there was a white Dodge caravan with no license plate information and one or two men in the area. At around 1pm on Sunday the 31st of December, the Iowa County Sheriff's Office in Wisconsin received a tip about the vehicle that had been involved in the abduction in Indiana and stopped at the Quick Trip convenience store in Barnveld, Wisconsin. While making their way to the store, officers were informed that the vehicle had left and was traveling in the township of Dodgeville and US Highway 151. Dodgeville police officers were dispatched to assist the Iowa County Sheriff's Office deputies who located the vehicle traveling south on US Highway 151 when they initiated a traffic stop on the vehicle at around 1.30pm. Police said they found Natalia inside the car and safely removed her, and took three kidnappers into custody. 27-year-old Zachary Delosia of Edgemont, South Dakota, 23-year-old Sarah Gordino of Rapid City, South Dakota, and 24-year-old Ozias Rivers of Rapid City, South Dakota were booked into their Iowa County Jail. All three have warrants for kidnapping of a minor out of Wells County and will be extradited back to Indiana. Officials have not said why the trio took Natalia, or where they were headed. The investigation into the matter continues. 23-year-old Connor Crum Ryan is behind bars for fatally stabbing his mother. At around 7.19am on Tuesday the 26th of December, deputies responded to 174 Chelsea Court in Port Charlotte, Florida on reports of domestic violence inside the home. Authorities said that Connor stabbed his mother Jennifer Crum Ryan, and that two of Connor's sisters were also in the home, struggling to grab a knife from him, and called 911. Connor also stabbed one of his sisters while she wrestled to get the knife away from him. She was stabbed in the back and had multiple minor cuts to her hands and arms during the struggle. When deputies arrived at the scene, they found Jennifer in a critical condition with multiple stab wounds to her neck. Paramedics treated Jennifer and transported her to a local hospital where she later died. Deputies found Connor on top of his sister in the bedroom with a knife still in his hand. He was given commands to drop the knife which he ignored, resulting in him being tased. He was forcefully removed from the bedroom and detained at the scene. There was blood on the inside of the home and on Connor's clothing. Authorities said that the family had plans to go on a cruise that day. But Connor had been making statements to the family the night before about heaven and hell and trying to teach them how to get into a fetal position. 
Connor was also making finger gun gestures. The family locked their bedroom doors the night before out of fear. When they woke up in the morning, Jennifer told her daughter that she would not be going on the cruise. She said she was going to get Connor help at the Charlotte Behavioural Health Centre. Authorities said that Jennifer told Connor of her intent to take him for treatment, and he started procrastinating getting ready. While Connor's other sister was on the phone, she heard her mother scream, He's stabbing me. He's stabbing me. Connor's charged with three counts of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon and resisting an officer without violence. He's held at the Charlotte County Jail on a $710,000 bond. He's ordered to have no contact with his sisters and have no firearms or weapons in his possession. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating after a 25-year-old man was found fatally shot inside a home. At 8.23pm on Saturday the 30th of December, authorities responded to a residence in the 2200 block of Arlington Avenue, near Fernley Street in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive man lying on the main floor of the house with multiple gunshot wounds. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The Allegheny County Medical Examiner's Office identified the victim as 25-year-old Grant Gibault of Pittsburgh. No suspects have been identified, and the motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A church pastor has been arrested for attacking a McDonald's worker and trying to stick his head into a deep fryer. On Thursday the 28th of December, the pastor's wife, 44-year-old Latoya Gladney, was working at the fast food outlet at 2738 South Main Street in High Point, North Carolina as a manager in training when other employees started disrespecting her. As a result, Latoya called her husband, 57-year-old Dwayne Waden, to help with the situation. Witnesses told police that when Dwayne arrived, he walked into the McDonald's, then went around the counter and placed his hands around the victim's neck, identified as 34-year-old Theodore Garlington. After grabbing Theodore's neck, Dwayne then pushed his head toward one of the deep fryers. Dwayne punched Theodore in the face several times and did not stop striking him until other employees managed to pull Dwayne off the victim. Theodore suffered a large contusion to the forehead and right eye, as well as scratches on his neck. Medics responded to the scene, though Theodore chose to let his family transport him to the hospital. Officers viewed surveillance footage of the incident and arrested Dwayne for assault. He was taken to the High Point Police Headquarters where he was released on a thousand dollar bond. According to Dwayne's Facebook page, he works as a semi-truck driver and is a pastor at Elevated Life International Ministries in nearby Thomasville. McDonald's confirmed that Latoya was no longer working with the organization, adding that the safety and security of our employees and customers is our top priority. Latoya and Dwayne married a month prior to the McDonald's incident. The investigation into the matter continues. A 39-year-old woman's been charged with murder after fatally running over a 60-year-old woman with her car. At 2.27pm on Friday the 8th of December, authorities responded to the 1100 block of Broadway Avenue in San Pablo, California on reports of a collision involving a vehicle and a pedestrian. When officers arrived, they learnt that a 60-year-old woman had been struck by a vehicle driven by 39-year-old Danae Blakely of Richmond, California. Medics transported the 60-year-old victim to a local hospital with severe injuries. Authorities claim that Danae deliberately drove into the victim after the two got into a verbal altercation. Investigators said that Danae is believed to have recognised the victim as someone who had previously stolen a package from her residence, and Danae confronted the victim as she walked along the 1100 block of Broadway Avenue. The altercation escalated and resulted in the subsequent collision. Evidence was collected at the scene and investigators determined that the collision was an intentional act of assault. Danae was arrested on scene without incident, and was booked into the Contra Costa County Jail on charges of attempted murder and assault with a deadly weapon. On the 23rd of December, the victim succumbed to her injuries and Danae's attempted murder charge was upgraded to murder. Danae remains held at the Contra Costa County Jail on a $1 million bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Three people were behind bars in connection to the fatal shooting of an off-duty police officer. Authorities said that around 4pm on Saturday the 30th of December, Sergeant Philip Dale Nix witnessed three suspects attempting to steal 10 cases of beer at the Sheets gas station at 3202 Sandy Ridge Road in Colfax, North Carolina. 
The suspects were intending to later sell the beer to purchase narcotics. When Sergeant Nix approached the suspects, he was fatally shot. Another off-duty officer and a Guildford County paramedic were on scene when Sergeant Nix was shot and immediately rendered aid as the suspects fled. Sergeant Nix was transported to a local hospital where he was pronounced dead. The suspects were seen leaving the area in a black Chevrolet Equinox along Interstate 40 West towards Winston-Salem. By 8pm that night, authorities located the vehicle and arrested the trio. 18-year-old Jimmy Foster, 18-year-old Zakira Blackwell, and 28-year-old John Morrison were all charged in connection to Sergeant Nix's murder and all held at the Guilford County Jail. Jimmy was recognised as a gunman and was charged with first-degree murder, larceny, and conspiracy to commit larceny in his held without bond. A warrant indicates that Jimmy was trying to steal $232.90 in beer from the store, but ultimately made off with several Modelo beer cases valued at $83.45. Zakira was charged with accessory after the fact of first-degree murder, and is held on a $500,000 bond. John was charged with accessory after the fact of first-degree murder, Larceny and conspiracy to commit larceny has been held without bond. Further charges are possible, police said. Sergeant Nix had served 23 years with the Greensboro Police Department. The investigation into the matter continues. A 10-year-old boy and his father were arrested after the boy fatally shot another boy his age using a stolen gun. At just after 4.30pm on Saturday the 30th of December, Authorities responded to a call of a shooting in the 4700 block of Green Home Drive in Sacramento, California. Initial reports from witnesses stated that the victim was 13 to 14 years old and that he had been shot. When deputies arrived, they located an unresponsive juvenile in the middle of the parking lot bleeding from his head and neck. Deputies immediately began life-saving measures on the victim until Sacramento Metro Fire Department personnel arrived on scene. The victim was transported to a local hospital where he was later pronounced dead. He was later confirmed that the victim was identified as Keith Fryerson, who was only 10 years old. Witnesses told deputies that the suspect ran into a nearby apartment, so officials went to the residence and detained 53-year-old R. Keith Davis and two juveniles. Homicide detectives and crime scene investigators responded to the scene, interviewed witnesses and gathered evidence. Based on their investigation, they learnt that one of the juveniles detained, a 10-year-old boy, went to his father's vehicle to get him cigarettes. He then took a gun from inside the vehicle and bragged that his father had a gun. He then shot the victim once and ran into a nearby apartment. Detectives located a firearm in a nearby trash can, where Akeet, the boy's father, is believed to have tried to dispose of it. Detectives confirmed that Akeet was prohibited from owning or possessing a firearm. The recovered firearm was also reported stolen in 2017. The juvenile suspect was arrested and transported to the Sacramento County Youth Detention Facility, where he's charged with murder. Arkeet was arrested and transported to the Sacramento County Main Jail, where he was charged with several felony firearm charges, child endangerment, and accessory after the fact. Arkeet's been held on a $500,000 bond and is scheduled to appear in court on the 3rd of January. Keith's mother, Brittany Fryson, said that her son and the suspect were playing outside on their bikes when the shooting occurred. She said that the suspect lost the bike race and then shot her son. She added that her son considered the shooter a friend. The investigation into the matter continues. 44-year-old Kenneth Brown is behind bars for fatally shooting his ex-girlfriend, 34-year-old Maria Roke, in front of her two children. The shooting occurred at 6.23am on Wednesday the 13th of December in front of Maria's home in the 500 block of North Long Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. Maria was putting her eight-year-old daughter into a rental car when Kenneth approached her. As Maria tried to get away, Kenneth shot her multiple times in the shoulder, chest and thumb before fleeing the scene. Maria struggled to breathe and became unresponsive. Her 14-year-old son attempted CPR on her and she was taken to the Stroger Hospital where she was pronounced dead at 6.53 a.m. Maria had been granted an emergency order of protection against Kenneth on the 7th of November. A week before that, the pair had an argument that turned physical when Kenneth grabbed Maria and threw her to the ground. Kenneth also threatened to burn Maria's car, break her windows and destroy her belongings. The order of protection barred Kenneth from contacting Maria in any way, including entering her home or harassing, stalking or intimidating her. He was also prohibited from taking the eight-year-old daughter from her care. That order of protection was extended on the 28th of November and once again on the 13th of December. 
the morning of the shooting. On Friday the 29th of December, members of the Great Lakes Regional Fugitive Task Force located Kenneth in the 3100 block of West Harrison Street and he was arrested. Kenneth's charged with first degree murder and is held at the Cook County Jail without bond. Marie's children are staying with family. The investigation into the matter continues. A man fatally shot his friend after he had too much to drink. On the night of Saturday the 30th of December, 22-year-old Abraham Bordas was at 26-year-old Chase Capey's home along Southwest 146th Avenue in Ocala, Florida. Abraham had been invited there to drink and help paint the house when he found Chase's gun in a chair. Abraham picked it up, pointed it at Chase and said, Well, buddy, this is a nice gun. He then pulled the trigger and fatally shot Chase in the stomach. Abraham told deputies that he did not intentionally shoot Chase, who was one of his best friends. He also said he was unaware that the gun was loaded and the safety was off. He admitted to being intoxicated at the time of the shooting. He said he did not know he fired the weapon until he heard his friend say, Buddy, you shot me. A woman who was at the home at the time of the shooting told detectives that Abraham and Chase had been drinking by the time she arrived to help paint. The woman said they painted one room and took a break. She said she was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard the men talking, laughing and listening to music. She said she saw Abraham holding a gun and looking at the gun from the side. He was moving it around and it appeared the firearm was pointed at Chase. She said that she then saw Abraham squeeze the trigger. She said that Chase stumbled from the couch and told Abraham that he had been shot and to call 911. She said she tried to stop the bleeding with paper towels and he later lost consciousness. Walking outside, she heard sirens and first responders running toward the residence. Medics transported Chase to a local hospital where he later died. Inside the residence, a detective found a loaded gun on a counter. The detective also recovered a shell casing and a loaded magazine. Abraham was arrested and charged with negligent homicide. He was booked into the Marin County Jail that night, but was released in the morning after posting a $30,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A woman is behind bars after attempting to douse a police officer with lighter fluid and set him on fire. The incident occurred on Saturday the 2nd of January in Latter, South Carolina where an officer was attempting to arrest 38-year-old Melissa McCoy for criminal trespass. Authorities said Melissa actively resisted arrest by dousing lighter fluid all over the officer and attempted to ignite the officer with a lighter. Police said they were able to subdue Melissa and take her into custody. The injured officer was treated at a local hospital and was later released. His identity has not been disclosed, but he's reportedly doing well. Melissa's charged with attempted murder, trespassing, resisting arrest and threatening the life of a public official. She's out at the Dillon County Detention Center with bond denied. The investigation into the matter continues. 47-year-old Derek Rayborn is behind bars for beating his girlfriend, fatally shooting her son and their family dog. At 4.30am on Monday the 1st of January, the Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Office in Louisiana received a report of a woman at a local hospital suffering from severe injuries. The victim told investigators that her boyfriend, 47-year-old Derek Rayborn, killed her 26-year-old son Eric Bosley and their dog at the home at the Oakhurst Mobile Estates in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The woman said that Derek beat her and she was able to escape the residence and went to the hospital for medical treatment. When deputies arrived at the residence, they noticed blood on the front doorsteps. They made entry and found Derek and the dog dead inside with gunshot wounds. Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Office Chief Deputy Stitch Guillory said that during a domestic dispute, the son tried to defend his mother and that's how he ended up as a victim. He also said the injuries to the woman's face were beyond recognition adding it's unbelievable that one human being could do this to another human being. Deputies found Derek at the hospital as he's trying to locate his girlfriend. He was arrested and charged with second degree murder, attempted second degree murder, domestic abuse causing serious bodily injury, aggravated cruelty to animals, interfering with emergency communication, possession or carrying a firearm by a person convicted of certain felonies, and illegal use of a weapon during a violent crime. He remains held at the Calcasieu Correctional Center on a $2,375,000 bond. Derek has five previous felony convictions and has served time in prison. The woman remains hospitalized and is recovering. The investigation into the matter continues. 
Police are searching for 36-year-old Sammy Patrick, who's wanted for multiple offences, including capital murder for the death of 78-year-old Dee Edie. At around 2pm on Saturday the 30th of December, Sammy went to Dee's house at 3847 Old Jackson Road in Forest, Mississippi, where he sexually assaulted, fatally shot and burned her. Sheriff Mike Lee said that Dee was on her phone with a relative when she told them that she heard a dog barking. She hung up the call and went out to check what was happening. Shortly after, another family member who had access to a security camera could tell the camera was moved or was not functioning properly, so he went to the residence to check on things. When he arrived at Dee's home, he found her underneath the carport fatally shot and burned. The home was ransacked, but Dee's purse still had money in it. Her late husband's gun collection was all accounted for, and it's unclear if anything is missing. Sheriff Lee said Sammy shot Dee outside her home, then burned her body to cover his tracks. Sheriff Lee said that detectives do not know of any direct connection between Dee and Sammy, even though they live near each other. She was a widow, and resided by herself. He explained there may have been, if any, some interaction, but there would not be any direct links such as him working for her, or knowing her in a personal situation. On the afternoon of Monday the 1st of January, Sammy drove a stolen truck to Subway store along Highway 61 South in Woodville near the border of Louisiana, where he ordered a sandwich and robbed a shop before driving away. Woodville Police Chief Lumiel Rutledge said that his office got a 911 call at 2.57pm, reporting the robbery at the subway. Sammy ordered a meatball sub, and was said to have been polite when ordering his food, even saying yes ma'am, no ma'am, but when he went to pay, he took out two handguns and demanded money and the keys to the clerk's vehicle. The cashier handed him the money, but she refused to give him her keys. He left with the money during the robbery, but no vehicle. Chief Rutledge said that no one was hurt during the robbery, but the clerk was shaken. He said investigators were able to secure video and steal photos of the suspect from a stop he made at the Shell gas station in Woodville located next to the subway. Sammy was seen driving a two-door dark-colored Ford Ranger, bearing a disabled tag that was reported stolen on Old Highway 21 in Forest County, Mississippi. Mississippi Highway Patrol, Louisiana State Police and other law enforcement agencies are continuing to search for Sammy, who is wanted on multiple charges including auto theft, burglary and capital murder. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating the fatal shooting of a 28-year-old man. At just before 6.45pm on Tuesday the 2nd of January, Authorities responded to the Conoco gas station at 2401 Chambers Road in St. Louis, Missouri. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive man with multiple gunshot wounds. He was pronounced dead at the scene. He was identified as 28-year-old Dajian Miller of St. Louis. Police said the shooting happened at an unknown location, and the victim drove himself to the gas station, where he later died. No arrests have been made to date, and the motive of the killing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. A woman slapped and punched her elderly father in the face over his oxygen machine making a beeping noise. At around 5am on the 25th of December, authorities responded to a home in Granada Court in Lady Lake, Florida on reports of a battery occurring. When officers arrived at the property, they were met by 49-year-old Christina Grenados at the end of the driveway. She told police that she and her 73-year-old father got into an argument over his oxygen machine and due to the way her father was speaking to her and admitted to slapping him in the face. Officers went inside the residence and spoke with the father who confirmed the argument about the oxygen machine making a beeping sound. He said that he and his daughter argued and then she punched him in the left side of his head. Authorities said that the father and daughter have been living together for the past three years. Christina was arrested and charged with domestic battery in a person 65 years of age or older. She was booked into the Lake County Jail and was released the next day after posting the $1,000 bond. She's been ordered to have no contact with her father. The investigation into the matter continues. 31-year-old Trisha Lynn Lempierre is behind bars on multiple charges in connection to the death of a newborn baby. The investigation began on the 5th of December, when Westland Police in Michigan responded to a hospital and report of an infant death. Police did not believe their death was an accident. Investigators said that Trisha had given birth one week prior to home, in Bannister Court in Westland, Michigan, did nothing else and the infant died inside the residence. Authorities said that no medical attention had been requested. Neighbours were shocked to learn about the incident, 
and said other children live at the home with a woman. One neighbour claimed to have heard cries from the home, but those cries stopped. On Wednesday the 3rd of January, Trisha was arrested and booked into the Wayne County Jail on charges of felony murder, first degree child abuse, and concealing the death of an infant child. She's held without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A couple of behind bars after the infant child was exposed to fentanyl. On Wednesday the 27th of December, Salisbury Police in North Carolina were made aware that a baby had been taken to the Novent Health Royal Medical Center for possible fentanyl exposure. The Salisbury Police Department Criminal Division responded and was able to determine that the infant was exposed to high levels of fentanyl while in the care of its parents. On Wednesday the 3rd of January, 36-year-old Felicia Nicole Robinson and 31-year-old Philip Wayne Ketchy were arrested and charged with felony child abuse. They're held at the Rowan County Detention Centre on $50,000 bonds. There's been no updates on the infant's condition as the investigation into the matter continues. Authorities in Bismarck, North Dakota are searching for a high-risk sex offender who removed his GPS bracelet and can no longer be accounted for or located. At around 8.30am on Wednesday the 3rd of January, authorities found 32-year-old Calvin Payne's discarded bracelet off East Rosser Avenue in Bismarck, North Dakota. Calvin's described as 6 foot 1 and 155 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. He has tattoos on either side of his nose as well as each side of his neck. Calvin was out of jail on supervision on several drug charges and twice failing to register as a sex offender. Authorities are appealing to anyone with information of his whereabouts to contact law enforcement, stressing the high-risk nature of the offender and the urgency to apprehend him before he commits further offences. 52-year-old Lee Carter is behind bars for kidnapping a pregnant woman and holding her captive and assaulting her in his garage for years. On the 5th of January 2024, authorities found Lee at a motel in Houston, Texas, and was arrested and charged with aggravated kidnapping. Authorities said that Lee found the victim panhandling while driving along a major Genoa road in Houston, Texas. He pulled over and approached the woman, and gave her a dollar and offered to help her if she got in his car. She accepted, and he drove her back to his home at 5251 Perry Street in Houston, Texas, where Lee held her against a will for four to five years. The woman told police that Lee forced her to have sex with him, make her take drugs and prevented her from leaving the house by locking her inside a garage. The woman said she did not have a shower in the garage, so from time to time Lee would allow her to leave the room to shower. The woman said she never saw anyone else in the home while she was kept there, but could hear Lee arguing with other women while she showered. She said on numerous occasions, when Lee would take her from the garage to the home, she attempted to run away and escape. Each time Lee would run after her, grab her and return to the garage and lock her inside again. The woman said she pleaded with Lee to let her go, but she was threatened with physical violence. She said that when she begged him to let her leave, Lee would force her to take pills along with crack cocaine and other illegal drugs, causing her to become physically unable to leave. She said she told Lee on numerous occasions that she didn't want to take drugs, but continued to force her to take them. She said that Lee provided her with chips and snacks for food, but she was hardly able to get a full meal. When she spoke to police, the woman said she had not showered in almost two months. The woman said she was able to escape once before, but ended up in hospital and Lee came and picked her up and locked her in the garage again. He then put boards up on the exterior of the garage window to prevent her from escaping again. Authorities said that on the 7th of April 2023, Lee allowed the victim to use his laptop, where she used her text now application to contact police and tell them that she was being held against her will. Officers responded to Lee's property and rescued the woman from the garage. Inside the garage there was a makeshift toilet that did not flush, a sink with water that dripped, a mattress covered with vomit and assorted chips and a few Twinkies. Officers noted that the victim was extremely malnourished, weighed about 70 pounds and had a pungent stench. Her clothes were very dirty and she had no shoes. Even though the victim was rescued, authorities said that they do not know her current location. Her identity has not been released and it's unclear what happened with her pregnancy. On the 5th of January 2024, police conducted a welfare check at Lee's residence after some reported seeing a TV on and hearing a dog barking. Officials said they were concerned because they hadn't heard from the victim. Police responded to Lee's residence and found a dog inside the garage, feces on the floor in an empty room with a TV on. The dog was rescued and no one else was found. Lee was located at a local motel later that day 
and was taken into custody. He was charged with aggravated kidnapping and he's been held at the Harris County Jail on a $100,000 bond. If released, he'll have to wear a GPS tracker and he's prohibited from having contact with the victim. Authorities said that an arrest warrant was filed against Lee in April of 2023 after the woman was rescued. It's unclear how Lee was able to avoid arrest for nine months since. Lee's employed as a real estate broker and has seven children, ranging from one to 31 years old. He also performs as a rapper in the Houston area under the stage name Viper. The investigation into the matter continues. A 35-year-old man is behind bars after he broke into a home and raped a 12-year-old girl in her bedroom while her parents were asleep, threatening to kill the child if she screamed. At 7.46am on the 2nd of December, authorities responded to residents in the Blair Hills neighborhood of Culver City, California, on reports of a sexual assault. When officers arrived, they made contact with the 12-year-old victim and her parents. Investigators determined that between 2 to 3 a.m., the perpetrator entered the home through an unlocked balcony door at the back of the home. He then went through the grandparents' bedroom before entering the girls' bedroom where he carried out the assault on the juvenile for more than four hours. During the assault, the suspect told the girl that there was a shooter at her window and that she'll be killed if she screamed. At around 7 a.m., the suspect exited the home through the front door and fled the scene on foot. The victim's parents said that their daughter woke them up that morning and immediately told them they needed to call 911. Detectives later identified Marcus Maldonado as a suspect through DNA evidence that linked him to the crime scene. A neighbor's security camera also filmed him leaving the victim's home after the break-in and assault. On Thursday the 4th of January, Marcus was arrested in the Santa Clarita area while aboard a Bakersfield-bound bus along the Interstate 5 freeway. Officers pulled the bus over and Marcus was taken into custody. He's charged with aggravated sexual assault of a child, with bond set at $1,250,000. Authorities said that Marcus had been staying at a downtown Los Angeles hotel prior to his arrest. There's no evidence indicating that Marcus knew the girl, and police believe there may be more victims. The investigation into the matter continues. A woman is behind bars after admitting to smothering a terminally ill boyfriend with a pillow because she was disgusted with having to care for him as he lay dying of cancer. Authorities said that 69-year-old Margaret Keone admitted to suffocating her boyfriend of 15 years, 72-year-old Gary Polony with a pillow on the 20th of December, at the home at 7516 Sheldrake Street in Newport, Ritchie, Florida. Margaret left the body of Gary, who was under hospice care for rectal cancer, to be discovered by nurses the following morning on the 21st of December. Deputies with the Pasco County Sheriff's Office were called to the scene and observed that the man had no concerning injuries and initially believed he died in his sleep. Later that day, however, authorities received a call from a witness who met with investigators and told them that she was a friend of Margaret's for over 30 years. The friend said that within the last few days of Gary's life, Margaret expressed disgust when it came to taking care of Gary because he was defecating himself due to his illness. Investigators said that Margaret's friend told them that Margaret did not clean Gary and would wait for a hospice worker or home health care nurse to visit and clean him. Margaret's friend told authorities that she received a call from Margaret at 10.30pm on the 20th of December, where Margaret told her that she had smothered Gary with a pillow and that he was gone. Margaret then told her friend that she planned to cover her dead boyfriend with a blanket so that when the nurse came the next day, she would assume he died in his sleep. During a controlled phone call between Margaret and her friend the following day, Margaret was quoted as saying she felt better about the situation and confirmed using the pillow to smother her boyfriend. When interviewed by detectives, Margaret confessed to killing her boyfriend by pressing a pillow into his face for five minutes after he called her into the bedroom complaining of pain. Margaret said that her boyfriend was alive and alert before she smothered him and was no longer breathing after she removed the pillow from his face. Margaret told the investigators that her decision to kill Gary was to prevent him from being in any further pain. She also admitted to intentionally over-medicating Gary with liquid morphine to help with his pain. After suffocating him, Margaret spent the night on the couch and when the nurse came the following day, she believed that her boyfriend died of natural causes in his sleep. On Tuesday the 2nd of January, Margaret was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. She's held at the Pasco County Jail with bonds set at $250,000. Investigation into the matter continues. 32-year-old Tatum Hatch, a former teacher at West Monroe High School in Louisiana, is accused of having an improper relationship with a 15-year-old male student. 
On Wednesday the 3rd of January 2024, Tatum was arrested following an investigation that began on the 15th of December 2023, after the student told his father about the illicit relationship, and the father then contacted police. The father told investigators that his son showed him Instagram messages that the two had been exchanging, and that the relationship had been going on for about a year and a half. Deputies met with the teen victim and monitored his cell phone, finding Instagram messages between them that spanned over several months. In one of their conversations, Tatum told the child that she wanted them to have sex, telling him that he could go through her bedroom window. She said she believed it was safer for him to come to her house, rather than meeting at his home. She then asked the boy if he liked to be rough or gentle with her, with the boy responding by asking her what she wants. Tatum then replies that she doesn't know, but she's thought about it. The boy told Tatum that he was scared, and Tatum responded by saying that she was scared too, and that she was worried he would find another person to take his virginity. Investigators said that Tatum drove to the boy's home late one night, and he entered her car at the end of his driveway, where she touched his genitals with her infant child in the car. Tatum sent naked selfies to the boy in what's known as vanish mode, where pictures eventually disappear. Authorities said they were able to recover a nude photo of Tatum on the victim's phone after a forensic download was completed. Another one of their conversations took place at a school function after dismissal, where Tatum tried to get the boy to sit with her. On the 16th of December, police took Tatum in for questioning. Tatum refused to answer several questions about what she sent to the teen, fearing she would lose the children. She did, however, admit to talking to the boy via Instagram messages. Authorities later discovered that Tatum gave the boy between $500 and $600 after she became afraid of the victim because of a rumor she heard about him, and that is why she gave him money. Tatum resigned from a job at West Monroe High School on the 26th of December, after earlier being placed on administrative leave on the 15th of December. On Wednesday the 3rd of January, Tatum was booked into the Washita Parish Sheriff's Office Jail and was charged with computer-aided solicitation of a minor, but was released the next day after posting a $10,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Forty-seven-year-old Benjamin Hall, a teacher at Woodward Middle School in Oklahoma, has been arrested after being accused of molesting school children. Parents of the students said they reported the physical education teacher Benjamin Hall's activities to the assistant principal because the school's head principal Sarah Hall is the accused teacher's wife. The parents of the students said, however, there was no follow-up. Complaints were brought to the school's attention as early as 2017, but the students said that Benjamin was touching them inappropriately since his first year at the school in 2012. Benjamin is said to have often slapped female students' buttocks with a ruler or his hand and made comments of a sexual nature. One student reported he told her he just wanted to see how well it bounced back when he struck her buttocks. Other students reported that he'll stand behind them while he had them stretch, but he wouldn't let them change out of skirts or dresses for class. Woodward Police Captain Darren Nevertel said that students complained, they didn't see anything coming of it, parents complained, didn't see anything coming of it, adding that he didn't know why the behaviour wasn't reported to police. Benjamin was also the school softball coach for a time. One former player told investigators that Benjamin cupped her breast, and another said he put his hand on her upper thigh, making her so uncomfortable she quit her senior year. On Thursday the 4th of January 2024, Benjamin was arrested at his home and charged with seven counts of lewd acts to a child. He was booked into the Woodward County Jail, but was promptly released after posting a $100,000 bond. Police said they believe there are more victims, and encouraged them to come forward. The school district said it has put Benjamin on administrative leave. The investigation into the matter continues. A man is behind bars for fatally shooting his estranged wife outside a grocery store where she worked. At 11.11pm on Saturday the 6th of January, authorities responded to a parking lot of giant food at 3530 Sugarloaf Parkway at Urbana, Maryland on reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they found a woman deceased at the scene with gunshot wounds. Her victim was identified as 33-year-old Tanisha Butler, who was an employee at Giant Food. Authorities said the shooting happened just after the store closed at 11pm. Detectives spoke with witnesses and obtained video surveillance from the shopping centre, as well as neighbouring homes, and identified Frederick Owusasaki of Walkersville, Maryland as a suspect, who had fled the scene in his car. Within three hours of the shooting, investigators located Frederick in his vehicle and arrested him without incident. During a quick search of his car, deputies found a handgun on the front seat and an assault rifle in the back seat. 
Investigators said that Frederick was an estranged husband of the victim, and the pair were going through a divorce, and that there was a history of protective orders and stalking by Frederick. Frederick was booked into the Frederick County Adult Detention Centre on charges of murder. The investigation into the matter continues. 43-year-old Nicholas Ken is behind bars for fatally shooting another man following a car crash. At around 7.30pm on Friday the 5th of January, authorities received multiple 911 calls about an accident at the intersection of Interstate 20 and South Main Street in Weatherford, Texas. When officers arrived on scene, they found a 44-year-old man deceased with a gunshot wound. Investigators said that Nicholas and the victim, whose name has not been released, were involved in a car crash and they got into an altercation. During the fight, Nicholas shot and killed the other man. Nicholas of Greenville, Tennessee was arrested that night and booked into the Parker County Jail. On Saturday the 6th of January, he was released on a $250,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 36-year-old Samantha Moore is behind bars after a 17-month-old child was found living in deplorable conditions. On the 28th of December, narcotics investigators with the Vicksburg Police Department conducted a welfare check at a mobile home in Lawland Road in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where Samantha and the child lived. During the investigation, the baby was found in uninhabitable conditions without sources of food or water. The baby appeared to not have been bathed for several weeks due to the dirty clothing and the child's appearance. Drug paraphernalia and drug residue were in the direct presence of the child, who police said had not received medical care in quite some time. While questioned, Samantha admitted to smoking meth and marijuana in front of the child on multiple occasions. Child Protective Services were called and placed the baby with family members. On the 4th of January, Vicky was arrested at a residence and booked into the Warren County Jail on a charge of felony child abuse. On the 5th of January, a judge set a bond at $250,000 on the condition that she has no contact with her child or any other minor children. The investigation into the matter continues. A man is behind bars for raping two young girls. On Sunday the 7th of January, 31-year-old Jonathan Gold of 1250 Bill Lane in Willisburg, Ohio, was arrested after authorities received a 911 call from a woman reporting the sexual assault of two juveniles under the age of 10. The caller claimed that her daughter and one other juvenile were the victims of the assault. Detectives from the Scioto County Sheriff's Office and Special Victims Unit responded promptly to initiate an investigation. Interviews with victims and witnesses led to the identification of Jonathan Gold as a suspect. Authorities went to Jonathan's apartment and executed a search of the residence, which yielded evidence related to the rapes. Jonathan was taken into custody and charged with 10 counts of rape of a child under the age of 10 and one count of pandering obscenity involving a minor. He remains held at the Scioto County Jail on a $1 million bond. Authorities said that additional charges are anticipated. The investigation into the matter continues. 38-year-old Vanessa Annalee Ledbetter is behind bars and is accused of killing a 58-year-old man. At 10.31am on Sunday the 7th of January, authorities responded to the Lakeshore Apartments Complex at 16 Lake Drive in Laurel Park, Hendersonville, North Carolina, after receiving an incomplete 911 call while an altercation was taking place. When officers arrived at the scene, they found a deceased white male victim laying in the rear patio area of the residence with what police described as an obvious fatal wound. At this time, police are not disclosing the type of wound, but said an autopsy will be scheduled shortly. The victim was identified as 58-year-old Robin Bracken, and during the investigation, authorities identified Vanessa as a suspect in his death. Vanessa was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, and is held at the Henderson County Detention Center without bond. Police have not released a motive in the killing, and the relationship between the victim and the suspect has not been disclosed, as the investigation into the matter continues. 70-year-old Michael Joseph Glynn is behind bars for fatally striking his 76-year-old wife Jackie Glynn in the head with a hammer inside the Nashville, Tennessee home and then burying a body in one of their properties in DeKalb County. On the 5th of January, concerned family reported Jackie missing who was last seen on New Year's Day at her home at 2418 Abbott Martin Road in Nashville, Tennessee and stated that she might be driving a 2010 Toyota RAV4. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation issued a silver alert for Jackie. She reportedly suffered from a medical condition that impaired her ability to return safely without assistance. The same day the alert was issued, 
Authorities completed a welfare check at the couple's seven-acre property at 4629 Allen Bend Road in Smithfield after learning from Joseph during a police interview that he had been there early that morning conducting a bonfire and DeKalb County officers arrived. They met Jackie's son who was also there looking for his mother, not knowing what happened to her. They also spoke to a neighbour who had reported having spotted a freshly dug hole in the property earlier, but that in recent days she noticed that the hole had been filled. Investigators began digging that hole, and later that afternoon they located Jackie's body deep down inside a plastic cargo box, with brand new roofing shingles and dirt laid on top. Investigators also located a Rav4 several miles away in Barnes Mill Road, which had been towed and hidden there by Joseph. During an interview with police, Joseph admitted to killing his wife in Nashville and then driving her body roughly 70 miles to DeKalb County the next day, where he buried her remains. Authorities determined that on the 16th of December, Joseph hired a contractor to dig a burial hole which was 6 feet wide, 10 feet long and 6 feet deep weeks before his wife's death. Joseph told the contractor the large hole was intended for a burn pit. After the killing, Joseph tossed the hammer in the Kaltenberg Community Centre trash compactor in Smithfield. Several days later, Joseph sold some of Jackie's possessions. He wanted to sell their DeKalb County property, but the real estate agent he tried to contact was out of town. Joseph had told his wife's children that she was terminally ill with cancer and planned to leave him. Jackie's medical provider, however, said that was not true. Police arrested Joseph on charges of criminal homicide, abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. At just before 3am on the 6th of January, he was booked into the downtown detention centre in Davidson County, where he remains held on a $1,030,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 24-year-old Sarah Lachey Harris is behind bars after her infant daughter died from overdosing on cough and cold medication after being left home alone with a toddler sister for 37 hours while she went out clubbing. On Friday the 5th of January, Sarah was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and child abuse in connection with the child's death. At 9.40am on the 30th of July 2023, authorities responded to Sarah's home near 19th Avenue Mountain View Road in Phoenix, Arizona after receiving a call about an infant not breathing. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive six-week-old infant girl laying on her back on a mattress on the living room floor. She was unable to be saved and was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators reportedly noted that the victim's head appeared sunken, and her body temperature was far colder than the temperature of the room, indicating that she'd been dead for some time. When questioned, Sarah told investigators that her infant was fussy the night before, so she gave the baby ibuprofen with a syringe and food. She carried the baby around the apartment until they lay down to sleep. She said that when she woke up on the morning of the 30th of July, she left the apartment and went to the corner market at around 8am. She said that when she came back about an hour later, she had to have someone let her in the building because she had forgotten to take her keys with her. She said upon entering the child's room, she found her daughter with a blanket over her face and not breathing. She then called her parents who called 911. Authorities obtained surveillance footage that contradicted Sarah's story about being at the apartment the previous night. It showed that she had left the apartment at 7.23pm on Friday night on the 28th of July and only returned for the first time at 9.12am on Sunday morning on the 30th of July. Surveillance footage captured at 10am on the 29th of July showed a man opening Sarah's apartment door slightly and walking away moments later. Police obtained a search warrant for Sarah's apartment and discovered a bottle of NyQuil for children six years and older, as well as a syringe with red liquid remnants that appeared the same colour as the NyQuil in the kitchen on top of the microwave. Investigators searched a trash can and found a baby bottle with what appeared to be white milk that had a pinkish hue to it, and red liquid in the nipple of the bottle. An autopsy determined that the infant's cause of death was from chlorpheniramine intoxication and an unsafe sleeping environment. Chlorpheniramine is an antihistamine found in medications such as NyQuil, cold and flu. During the investigation, police said they discovered text messages between Sarah and an unknown male between 11.18am and 3.22pm on the 28th of July in which a man offered Sarah money for sexual acts to be performed in a car. Sarah was seen leaving her apartment at 3.53pm on the 28th of July and returning at 4.42pm that same day. On the 5th of January 2024, Sarah was detained and brought to the police headquarters for interviews. During questioning, Sarah admitted to detectives that she gave her infant daughter NyQuil and melatonin in a bottle before leaving her and her toddler sister alone for 37 hours. She also confessed to taking illicit street drugs, drinking alcohol and going to a nightclub in nearby Tempe during this time. Investigators said that Sarah put the infant upright on a mattress and the toddler in the playpen before she left. She then asked a neighbour to check on her children while she was out. 
Sarah said that she became upset when she realized she'd been away for such a long period of time. Sarah was booked into the Maricopa County Jail with bond set at $100,000. The investigation into the matter continues. 20-year-old Connor Matthew Walker is behind bars for sexually assaulting a two-year-old girl. Authorities said that on the 28th of September 2023, Connor raped a toddler at a licensed in-home daycare centre located at 6565 Big Creek Parkway in Palmer Heights, Ohio. Investigators said that Connor, who has a Rocky River address about 10 miles away, had been living part-time at the residence where the daycare was held during the day. The daycare operator, who's a family friend of Connor, also allowed the victim to stay overnight on the same night Connor was staying at the residence. Authorities said that Connor sexually assaulted the girl in the bathroom and recorded and took photos of the assault. Detectives believe that the daycare operator had no knowledge of Connor's activities. On Friday the 5th of January, Connor was arrested following an investigation involving both the FBI and area officers. Connor's charged with one count of rape, as well as three counts of gross sexual imposition. Authorities said that those charges alone could land him in prison for the rest of his life if he's convicted, although authorities say more charges could be pending. Palmer Heights Police Detective Eric Taylor said at this point, we've identified one victim. We've reached out to all the families that we've been made aware who attended the facility. If we find other victims, we'll reach out to them and handle the prosecution for them, he said. Connor appeared in Palmer Municipal Court on Monday the 8th of January and remains held at the Cuyahoga County Jail on a $500,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 34-year-old woman is behind bars after the remains of a 4-year-old girl were found in a closet. At around 4.30pm on Sunday the 7th of January, authorities responded to an apartment in the 2000 block of Johnny Lane in Greenville, Mississippi after they received a call regarding the welfare concern of 4-year-old Zaya Smith. When officers arrived, they made contact with the father of the child, Leonard Smith, who had advised that Zaya had not been seen for weeks and came to speak with a relative who was keeping the child. Police were later led upstairs where Zaya's decomposing body was found in a plastic tote in a closet. Further investigation led to the arrest of 34-year-old Catricia Hardy of Greenville. Catricia is charged with manslaughter and child deprivation and remains held at the Washington County Regional Correctional Facility. Zaya's grandmother Pamela Hall said that she and the girl's mother Naisha Dixon hadn't seen Zaya for about two years and that they've been unable to get information from her father who had sole custody. The investigation into the matter continues. A man has been convicted of murdering his girlfriend's mother. On Monday the 8th of January 2024, 41-year-old Michael Sloan Jr. pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in connection with the fire-related death of 69-year-old Suzanne Tomlinson. Michael admitted that he set fire to Suzanne's home at 523 Wood Thrush Street in Troy, Illinois on the 22nd of September 2022, knowing that she was inside. The fire resulted in her death. Authorities said that Michael poured gasoline in Suzanne's duplex and doused her with gasoline. He also threw gasoline onto his girlfriend Courtney Tomlinson, who was 39 years old at the time, but she managed to escape and seek help. A neighbour called police after seeing their daughter running down the street. When police arrived moments later at 2.25pm, they saw Michael hold a cigarette lighter above his head and flick the lighter, resulting in a fireball. Michael had yelled to police that he intended to kill everyone, Flames and heavy smoke hindered attempts to get into the burning home. An autopsy revealed that Suzanne died of smoke inhalation and burn injuries. Mike was rescued from the fire and taken into custody after receiving medical treatment at a hospital. Courtney said that she and her boyfriend got into an argument about money he owed her, and when he didn't pay her, she asked him to leave, but he refused and doused her and her mother with gasoline before setting her mother and himself on fire. Michael faces up to 50 years in prison. His sentencing hearing is set for the 26th of February. Police are investigating after a 39-year-old man was fatally shot inside an apartment. At just before 7pm on Monday the 8th of January, authorities responded to the apartment complex at 2332 Fort Benning Road in Columbus, Georgia on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived, they went inside the residence and found a man unresponsive with multiple gunshot wounds. He was rushed to a local hospital in a critical condition, where he was pronounced dead. The victim was identified as 39-year-old William Thomas Brown. No arrests have been made to date, and the motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 
three people behind bars for fatally shooting a pizza delivery man during an attempted robbery. At around 12.50pm on Tuesday the 9th of January, authorities responded to 1001 Douglas Avenue in West Palm Beach, Florida on reports of a Domino's delivery driver getting shot. When officers arrived at the scene, they found a man in a critical condition lying on the ground in the street bleeding from his neck and arm. Investigators found three spent 9mm casings nearby and one unfired 9mm bullet under his body. Officers performed life-saving measures on the victim until paramedics arrived and transported him to the St. Mary's Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead at 1.17pm. The victim was identified as 33-year-old Tommy Anderson III. Authorities said that the resident at the home said they received the pizza from the victim and closed the door. Moments later, the person who received the pizza heard three shots fired and called 911. Savannah's footage from nearby homes showed a white four-door Honda vehicle that had a dent in the left rear door, pulling up to Tommy's car which had a domino sign on the roof. The driver of the Honda was seen wearing a round, hockey-styled mask. Authorities put on a be on a lookout alert for the Honda, and at 4.45pm that same day, Florida Highway Patrol spotted the car at the intersection of Belvedere Road and Military Trail and performed a traffic stop. Suspects 25-year-old Elijah Wingfield, 25-year-old Aviana Kill Williams and 29-year-old Marcus Williams were in the car and were taken into custody. During a search of the car, officers found two rifles in the rear seat and a black 9mm handgun under the front passenger seat. During an interview with detectives, Elijah initially told investigators he shot Tommy because the man matched the description of a person who killed one of his relatives, but later changed his story. Elijah then admitted to shooting Tommy during an attempted robbery, explaining that he needed the money because he was waiting for a paycheck he did not receive. He said that he and Marcus were passengers and Aviana was a driver. He said he recalled the car approaching Tommy's car, when Marcus said, Look, a delivery guy, they have money, stop the car. Elijah then said, Let's see what he's got. Elijah got out of the Honda armed with a 9mm handgun, while Marcus got out armed with an AR-15 rifle. The two suspects wore black ski masks and ran up to Tommy as he was walking to his car. Elijah pointed a gun at him and told him, I ain't playing with you. This ain't a game, and Tommy put his hands up. Elijah said that Tommy then told him that he too had a weapon and started to reach for his pocket. Elijah claimed he was afraid Tommy was going to shoot him, so he attempted to fire his weapon, but the gun jammed. He cleared an unfired bullet and then shot Tommy three times. Tommy grabbed his neck as he fell to the ground. The two suspects ran back to their car, and Aviana drove them away. Later in the interview, Elijah put his head down and said, I really fucked up my life. Marcus told investigators that he had a gun, and was back up for Elijah, but did not shoot Tommy because he saw the victim did not have a firearm. While detectives questioned Ariana, she initially denied being with Marcus and Elijah at the time of the murder, but later changed her story. She told investigators that she knew both men were armed, and had heard Elijah discussing how he needed to commit robberies to make money. Elijah, Marcus and Aviana are charged with first degree murder and were booked into the Palm Beach County Jail. The trio appeared at the Palm Beach County Court on the morning of Wednesday the 10th of January, where the judge ordered them to be held without bail. Tommy is survived by his two sons aged 6 and 13. He worked two jobs to support them, and it was only Tommy's second day as a pizza delivery driver when he was fatally shot. The investigation into the matter continues. A 23-year-old woman is behind bars for fatally stabbing a 24-year-old husband during a domestic fight that happened last year. At 2.16am on the 25th of June 2023, authorities responded to a home in Lizzie Jeter Lane in Cameron, North Carolina on a domestic violence-related call. When officers arrived, they found a man unresponsive with a stab wound to his chest, piercing his heart. Officers tried to resuscitate him, providing aid until paramedics arrived. However, he was pronounced dead at 2.49am. The victim was identified as 24-year-old Jose Polino. Officers questioned his wife, 23-year-old Lucy C. de la Fuente, who was not injured at the scene. She claimed that she stabbed her husband during a domestic fight and that she was defending herself. Investigators later determined the circumstances surrounding the stabbing did not support Lucy Sol's explanation that the act was done in self-defense. On Friday the 5th of January, Lucy Sol of Sanford was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and is held at the Harnett County Detention Center on a $500,000 bond. A man is behind bars following an overdose death at a motel. 
Investigators said that Terrell Quante led better of Malden, South Carolina, provided the drugs. On the 8th of October 2023, police were notified of an overdose-related death at the Stagecoach Motel at 612 East Main Street in Spindale, North Carolina. When officers arrived at the room, they found two victims. One was unconscious and another was deceased. The unconscious victim was treated with Narcan and transported to Rutherford Hospital where the victim was hospitalized for an extended period of time before his recovery. Authorities said that surveillance video, interviews and other information secured via search warrant helped to identify Terrell's involvement in distributing the lethal narcotics to the victims. On Monday the 8th of January 2024, detectives found Terrell's vehicle at the Town & Country Inn Suites at 188 Reservation Drive in Spindale and determined what room he was in and took him into custody. Terrell's charged with second degree murder and he's held at the Rutherford County Detention Centre without bond. 20-year-old Alicia Owens is behind bars and is accused of killing her boyfriend's 18-month-old daughter by forcing her to ingest harmful objects. And just after 4pm on the 25th of June 2023, emergency responders went to the home of couple Bailey Jacoby and Alicia Owens at 420 Electric Street in Newcastle, Pennsylvania after receiving a 911 call that a toddler had fallen ill there. When they arrived, they found Bailey's toddler daughter Iris Alfera breathing but she had a fixed glaze and a weak response. Medics transported her to UPMC Jemison Hospital, and the city police were summoned there by hospital personnel. Bailey told police that the child was in his and Alicia's custody that weekend, and the call was made to 911 when he was at the grocery store. He told investigators that Alicia called him, and said that Iris was lethargic, and that something appeared to be wrong. He told the police that he left the groceries at the cash register and went home. Alicia told police that she was feeding Iris on the bed that afternoon, when her arms and legs cramped up. Iris then immediately fell sideways off the bed and onto the floor, and Alicia said she saw Iris's chest collapse. She said she was a nurse in training, and tried to perform chest compressions. She called Bailey and he told her to call 911. Hospital physicians reported to police they suspected Iris's injuries were the result of child abuse. Alicia and Bailey told police that Iris had vomited a few times, but otherwise seemed normal, and she was functioning, sitting, eating and playing that day before Bailey left for the store. Iris was initially treated at the UPMC Jemison Hospital, and then flown in a critical condition to UPMC Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, where she suffered a brain bleed and hemorrhages of both retinas and was placed on life support, but later died on the 29th of June 2023. An autopsy completed the following day revealed Iris died from acetone poisoning, causing organ failure, which officials determined she had ingested shortly before her death. Acetone is a chemical commonly found in nail polish and paint removers. The medical examiner ruled Iris's death a homicide. Months before Iris died, she was hospitalized after swallowing different objects, including more than 20 water beads, three button-shaped batteries and a metal screw. Authorities said that around February 2023 until June of 2023, Alicia had conducted web searches on her cell phone related to the actions that ultimately led to the child's death. She researched household items that could kill or harm a child, including water beads, batteries and nail polish. Alicia searched for phrases such as beauty products that are poisonous to kids, medication leading to accidental poisoning deaths in children, what happens if a baby swallows a battery, if your child drinks a lot of nail polish remover what happens, can sunscreen poison a one year old baby, how many kids have died from eating water beads and many more. Following Iris's death, Alicia's search history included some deleted ones, such as how to pass a polygraph test, which was searched multiple times, and how to control your reaction to irrelevant questions, and have no reaction to relevant questions on the polygraph test. On Thursday the 11th of January 2024, Alicia was charged with criminal homicide, attempted homicide, aggravated assault of a child, endangering the welfare of a child, and other offences related to the abuse and death of Iris. Alicia is held at the Lawrence County Jail with bail denied. Iris's father was taken into custody and questioned, but was released after police confirmed he had no knowledge of the abuse. The investigation into the matter continues. 31-year-old Alyssa Roman is behind bars for fatally shooting her boyfriend, 33-year-old Alan Kritzer, and then fleeing the scene almost naked. At around 5.10pm on Friday the 29th of December, Authorities responded to a possible home invasion call at 7438 North 55th Plaza in Omaha, Nebraska. When police arrived, they found Alyssa Roman rushing out the back door of her residence only wearing a shirt. 
Officers caught up with her and took her into custody. She was exhibiting signs of excited delirium, so she was taken to a local hospital. Officers entered the residence and found Alyssa's boyfriend. Alan Kritzer deceased in the bedroom with gunshot wounds to the neck and upper torso, causing his head to be almost off the body. Officers then located a shotgun in a separate bedroom upstairs with women's pants and underwear placed over the tip of the gun that had blood on it. Witnesses told police that Alyssa had forced her way into the home only wearing a shirt. Once Alyssa was cleared from hospital, she told investigators that Alan did not shoot himself and that she and Alan were the only two in the home when he was killed. She was subsequently booked into the Douglas County Jail on charges of second-degree murder and use of a weapon to commit a felony. She remains held without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 69-year-old Richard Shaw, a pastor and church youth group leader from Riverton, Wyoming, is accused of molesting a young girl in Polk County, Florida. Authorities say that Richard travelled to Lakeland, Florida in December of 2023 over the Christmas holiday and spent nine days there. When he returned to Wyoming, the Polk County victim disclosed to her mother that Richard had inappropriately touched her underneath and over the top of her clothing while he was there. The mother called and spoke to Richard, who admitted to touching the child who was younger than 12 years old. Richard is a worship leader at Under Command Ministries in Riverston, Wyoming, and works in the youth ministry area as well. Polk County Sheriff's Office detectives notified the Fremont County Sheriff's Office who conducted their own investigation to determine if Richard had victimised any children there with whom he is in contact. Detectives learnt that Richard works at or is affiliated with other churches in the area, and further investigation by Wyoming authorities is ongoing. Detectives interviewed Richard, who told them he has an addiction to pornography, and that when he touched the Lakeland victim, he gave in to temptation. When asked during the course of the investigation, should we trust you with a child, he said no I wouldn't. On Thursday the 4th of January 2024, Richard was arrested in Riverton, Wyoming and booked into the Fremont County Jail and charged with two counts of lewd molestation on a child under 12 years of age and will be extradited to Polk County at a later date. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judge said we're working with Wyoming law enforcement to determine if this suspect victimised any other children there. We sincerely hope not. This man should never be allowed to have access to children again, he said. Authorities have not disclosed how Richard knew the victim and her mother. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating after a 21-year-old woman was fatally shot. At around 1.45am on Wednesday the 10th of January, authorities responded to a home along the 800 block of Greencrest Turn in Birmingham, Alabama on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive woman laying in the driveway of a home with gunshot wounds. She was pronounced dead at the scene. The victim was identified as 21-year-old Mia Nixon. Authorities said that a preliminary investigation suggests an unknown suspect shot Mia outside her home and left the scene. There were two other people inside the residence when the shooting occurred. However, no one else was injured. No arrests have been made to date, and the motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 24-year-old Shania Turner is behind bars for fatally strangling her 18-year-old girlfriend Tiara Horn and dumping her body. At around 5.40pm on Friday the 5th of January, authorities found a deceased body in thick brush along the walking trail, just off of the 1900 block of Nance Street in Houston, Texas. An autopsy revealed she died due to compression to the neck, and her death was ruled a homicide. Authorities said that Tiara's family had not seen or heard from her since Tuesday the 2nd of January and reported her missing on Thursday the 4th of January, a day before police made the discovery. During the investigation, authorities learned that Tiara and her girlfriend Shania got into a fight. Shania believed that Tiara gave her a sexually transmitted disease, so she strangled Tiara and dumped her remains along the Buffalo Bayou Trail, where her body was found. On Thursday the 11th of January, police arrested Shania and charged her with murder. She remains held at the Harris County Jail on a $100,000 bond. Tiara's sister, Rakesha Calton, said that Tiara met Shania around the same time her mother died in 2021. Rakesha said since meeting Shania, Tiara just got off track. She said it was clear that the relationship was violent, and she often saw Tiara with injuries to her face. But she said her sister wouldn't tell her the truth about what happened when asked about the injuries, which made going to the police hard. I can't help you if you don't tell me. We could have reported it, she said. Rikisha said that on Thursday the 4th of January, Tiara's phone pinged at Shania's apartment at McKee's City Living Apartment Complex, just around the corner from when the body was found. 
Tiara's other sister, Skanisha Granville, said that she used to live with the couple and their relationship was very toxic. They used to fight and everything. She said that many of the fights centered around accusations of infidelity. Shania used to cheat on my sister while she was in the house with her, she said. She also said that Shania was frequently violent with her sister. She used to hit on her and beat her, beat her up and stuff, and I just had to break it up, she said. Skanisha said at one point while she was living with the couple, she said that she and Shania got into an argument over dishes, which soon escalated. She threatened my life yelling at me, Skanisha said. The investigation into the matter continues. 28-year-old James Tate is behind bars for fatally shooting Marvin Anthony Miller Jr. and evading police. At 2.39am on Thursday the 11th of January, authorities responded to a residence at 4720 Northwest 16th Place in Gainesville, Florida on reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they entered the home and found Marvin deceased with multiple gunshot wounds. Officers received information that the suspect may be driving a silver Chevrolet work pickup truck. Officers located the pickup matching the description nearby and attempted to conduct a traffic stop. The driver James Tate refused to stop and fled from the officers at a high speed. Gainesville Police Department along with the Lateral County Sheriff's Office and the Columbia County Sheriff's Office pursued the vehicle onto Interstate 75. Officers used bike strips and the pickup eventually crashed into another vehicle in Columbia County and James was taken into custody. No injuries were reported from the crash. James was booked into the Columbia County Jail on a charge of fleeing and eluding. His bond is set at $5 million and he'll be extradited to Alachua County to face a murder charge. The house where the shooting took place was sold in August to Florida Beautiful Rentals. It's listed as a vacation rental in VRBO. Marvin and James were contractors and were staying at the home while renovating it when the men got into an altercation and James shot Marvin. After shooting Marvin, James chased another contractor out of the house. James then shot in his direction, striking a garage door of the home across the street. The investigation into the matter continues. A 49-year-old woman is behind bars for fatally stabbing a 69-year-old mother. And just after 5am on Tuesday the 9th of January, authorities responded to a home on Seagull Drive in Barefoot Bay, Florida, on reports of an injured woman. When deputies arrived at the premises, they found 69-year-old Cheryl Muir deceased inside with multiple stab wounds. After collecting evidence and conducting interviews, investigators determined that on the night of Monday the 8th of January, Cheryl and her daughter 49-year-old Kelly Tinsley got into an argument and then became involved in a physical altercation. During the fight, Kelly stabbed her mother to death. Kelly was arrested and charged with manslaughter, reclassified with the use of a weapon. She remains held at the Brevard County Jail with bail set at $750,000. The investigation into the matter continues. Two men are behind bars for dumping a woman's body in an alley after she overdosed in a motel room. At around 10.30am on Monday the 8th of January, authorities responded to a report of a dead person in an alley just south of 3564 52nd Avenue North in St. Petersburg, Florida. When officers arrived, they discovered the body of 30-year-old Julian Tully wrapped in a sheet with a cardboard box on top of her. Investigators determined that she died somewhere else and was dumped in the alley. Authorities said the case was initially investigated as a homicide because of where the body was found. However, after further investigation and an autopsy, led officials to determine that she died from a drug overdose. Detectives traced Julian's last known whereabouts to the Gateway Motel located at 4190 34th Street North in St. Petersburg, which is a few blocks away from where her body was discovered. Pinellas County Sheriff Bob Gualtieri said, It really is good old-fashioned boots on the ground police work, and what detectives found was an imprint on her leg. The imprint was there on a leg from a fence, and they matched it up to a fence at the motel. It took them back to the motel, and the sheet she was wrapped in was a motel-type sheet that would have come from a motel like the Gateway. He said that Julian was an unemployed transient with no physical address, was addicted to drugs and had an extensive criminal history. He explained that she's not a bad person. She's an addicted person who ended up doing some bad things. She ended up in trouble and ended up in the system and ended up being transient. But it's because of drug addiction. A drug addiction is what caused it, he said. Authorities determined that on the afternoon of Saturday the 6th of January, Julian was dropped off in the 800 block of 12th Avenue South in St. Petersburg and was last seen at the Gateway Motel at around midnight. John Yeckley, a maintenance man who was employed by and lived at the Gateway Motel, 
invited Jill in who he did not know into room number two. Jill had crack cocaine and fentanyl on her when she entered the room, and Jill injected fentanyl into her arm while John smoked the crack cocaine. John told investigators that he fell asleep around midnight, and when he woke up at around 5am, Jillian was on the floor dead in the motel room. Sheriff Gualtieri said that John freaked out because he had this dead woman on the floor of his room and he had drugs in his room, as opposed to doing what he should have done, which is call the police and report it. He recruited Michael Sloan, who's a local transient, to help him get rid of Jillian's body, he explained. Surveillance footage captured the pair remove her body from the room, wrap her in a sheet and put her on a small bike cargo trail and towed her with a bike. The men then dumped her body in the alley. John and Michael have been charged with tampering with evidence, an improper disposal of a body, and are held at the Pinellas County Jail. Authorities said that John and Michael both have a history of overdosing, and that Michael was recently brought back from the dead twice at the motel in the last couple of months, after deputies administered Narcan. The investigation into the matter continues. 45-year-old Seth Carnes is behind bars for fatally shooting his 74-year-old parents inside their home. At around 11.45pm on Monday the 8th of January, deputies responded to 310 County Road 317 in Georgetown, Texas on reports of a shooting. Seth's 19-year-old daughter called 911 and told authorities her father had shot her grandfather. When deputies arrived at the scene, Seth exited the home with one hand up and his other hand holding a coffee mug. Seth confessed to the deputies that he shot and killed his mother, Susan Carnes, and his father, Alfred Carnes, a retired former district court judge. Seth was taken into custody. While searching the home, deputies found Alfred dead on the living room floor about five feet from a recliner, and Susan was found deceased in an upstairs bedroom. Both died from gunshot wounds. Alfred had injuries to his elbow, in a forearm, and the left side of his rib cage. His wife had been shot in the left shoulder and collarbone. A shotgun and a spent shell was found lying in the kitchen area. Authorities said that Seth and his parents got into a disagreement, escalating into family violence and death. During an interview with detectives, Seth was asked to explain what happened, when Seth stated that he didn't really know, but that he knew he shot his mother and father. He further stated that he used a Remington 870 shotgun that was previously located next to his nightstand in his parents' converted garage where he lived. Seth said that he believed his mother was trying to put a sleeping pill in his mouth, and he did not want to take it. When detectives asked if there was any other reason as to why he shot his mother other than the sleeping pill, he stated that's it. When asked if there was a reason why he shot his father, he said I've been looking for something, and figured I would finish the job. At that time, Seth advised that he did not want to talk anymore, and the interview ended. Seth was arrested and faces capital murder charges. He remains held at the Williamson County Jail without bond.